remember that not everything needs to be serious. You, you can have a professional passion, um, and you can have a good time with it. Right. I've been so happy doing what I've been doing, though, which, I don't know, I'm, some days I feel like I'm the only one in the world who, who has been this lucky. Um, and then I tell people about, you know, what happened here in the early, mid-1980s, and then I always say, but it was a different world. Welcome to the UAUC talk show. Our goal with the show is to introduce you to the most interesting people with the most interesting ideas. Today we have a very, very special guest. Welcome. Thank you. What's, I, I like to start the conversation with uh, by asking this guitar that you have oh, here. What's the this, story behind it? So what's the story behind this? Um, I was a cellist before I was a map librarian. And it's... Playing the cello feeds the other side of my soul. So um, I have a collection of cello pins that I wear on special occasions. <laughs> I also have map pins, but I thought that might be too much to wear a map <laughs> pin to talk about maps. You brought maps. I brought maps. Yeah. So, no. No, so no map pin, yeah. no map <laughs> necklace, no map earrings, no map tennis shoes. I've got them all. Um, yeah. Most map librarians, at least the women, do tend to collect that kind of thing. I don't know why. Um, I also know a cartographer who owns many map shirts and map ties, so the guys do it too. So, you also, I'll also like to talk briefly about your story because mm -hmm. you have a, so I spent I, one day, a uh, random day, I don't remember, probably about a month ago or uh -huh. so, I stumbled upon the fourth floor, the fourth floor of the main library, never been there before, right. and I stumbled See what you were doing. You had these mm -hmm. maps, and there was something about how you were doing everything mm -hmm. that had a, le a certain level of um, curiosity and obsession that you don't usually see uh, around. Because you know, I could tell that you were really in your thing. You mm -hmm. really enjoyed what you were doing, regardless of what was going on. Sure. So, can you tell us more about how you got to Certainly. become the map librarian? Certainly. Um, I'm lucky in that. I don't have a job like I wanted. I have the job that I wanted when I was a senior in college here. Um, I, my first affiliation with the University of Illinois was in the 1970s when I came to the Illinois Summer Youth Music Program. Loved it, fell in love with the campus. Um, my parents had to force me to look at other colleges and universities. University of Illinois in Urbana was where I wanted to go to school. So I arrived here as a biology pre-med major. Um, let's just say that didn't go very well. Uh, I did not realize that I did not know how to think spatially in three dimensions. I'm really good in two dimensions, but not in three. The thing that I was really interested in as a bio pre-med major was actually DNA. DNA had not yet been sequenced. Um, and just this past week, I realized what it was about high school biology and genetics that I really liked. I had been enamored with Mendel's pea pods. And do you remember mm. that kind of tic-tac-toe grid where you right. have the big B and the little B and you combine them? I realized this past week that the thing that really I found interesting about all of that was how this concept was depicted spatially. So I guess I've been a spatial thinker all my life and mm. I didn't realize it. So I made it through two years of being a bio pre-med major. Organic chemistry killed me. Um, I ended up taking CS 101 instead of CS 103. 103 was for life science majors. 101 was for the CS majors and the engineers. Um, this was long enough ago that I was in one of the last classes to use key punch. And I think it's been long enough now that statute of limitations will have run out. I couldn't even figure out how to cheat in this class. Um, the person I was dating at the time was walking me back and forth across campus trying to get me help 
DCL, there was a lab in the basement of the Foreign Languages Building. It just didn't matter. So I was uh, late at night in the Foreign Languages Building and there was somebody else there who was in my section, realized I was having problems. He handed me his deck of cards and said, just use mine, it worked. I took his ID card off, put my ID card on. Now remember, he said it had just worked. I got an infinite loop. I hadn't dropped the deck of cards. I hadn't shuffled them. It still didn't work. I couldn't cheat to even get through the class. So um, I also, at the time, was a really good standardized test taker, which meant even though I had gotten C in calculus in high school, I tested into the third semester of calculus at the University of Illinois. Not a good situation. but. The other thing is that at this time, when you went and you took your placement test to be placed in a language class or math class, you could also take these other tests. I don't know what the acronym stood for, but they were called CLEP tests, I think C-L-E-P. And so I had tested out of having to take any kinds of arts or humanities. I just came in with all sorts of arts and humanities credits. I still had to take social science. Mm. So the spring of my sophomore year, as I'm flailing about in biology and organic chemistry, I took a class called the Geography of Illinois. I went home at the end of the spring semester and told my parents, my dad was a chemist, my mom was a musician, that I was changing my major to geography. Now, I think we've all experienced how moms can kind of look down their nose at you and let you know by how they are looking at you that you're doing the wrong thing. And it doesn't matter how tall or short they are, they still can do it to you. My mom, shorter than I am, she looked down her nose at me and said, and what are you going to do with a degree in the social sciences? To which I said, why, be a map librarian, of course. And it was the great epiphany of my life. I came home, I came back to campus that fall, so for the, my junior year, stood in line at the armory the third week of August, uh, to drop all of my biology and chemistry classes, overloaded with geography classes, talked myself into the Graduate School of Library and Information Science as a junior. I had been a geography major for less than a month when I applied for an internship at the National Geographic Society successfully. And on top of all of that, things had happened in the School of Music and they were short of cello players completely different era. I basically went into the School of Music and said something like, you pay, I play. And the School of Music paid a non-major tuition and fees to play in a string quartet and a piano quintet her junior year. Wow. My life fell into place when I said, why be a map librarian, of course. Uh, the person who was the map librarian at the time heard through the departmental grapevine that I was going to be an intern at the National Geographic Society and that my assignment was in the Society's Library. And he let it be known through the grapevine that he wanted to talk to me about a student position in the map library. So between my junior and senior year, I spent the summer in Washington, D.C., in the library at the National Geographic Society. I had a stacks pass to go into the stacks at the Library of Congress, which was totally cool. Um, I did a collection development program uh, project for them where I was comparing their holdings against holdings of other libraries in the city of Washington, D.C. Uh, to suggest things for them to purchase. I uh, came back after that experience, was hired as a student employee in the MAP library. Um, spent a fifth year on campus, um, jetting through the uh, graduate school, the master's program in library and information science as fast as I could. Um, finished up with not one, but two job offers before I finished the degree. Um, it's like things just fell into place. Um, my first job uh, was in a, at a small liberal arts university in Worcester, Massachusetts. Clark University. Um, it was small, but had a, a rich collection of maps. Um, I also did the buying for the main library for the geography related books. Um, the good thing about the size is that 
you know, I could make all of my beginner errors and they would be at a really small scale. It right. wasn't, I wasn't committing thousands of dollars because I didn't have thousands of dollars to spend. So it was a really good chance for me to figure things out. There was no class in map librarianship at the library school here. So when I was in library school, every single class, after the first class session, I would usually stop and talk to the faculty member and say, I'm going to be a map librarian. How will your class help me do that? And so they knew early on that I had a particular focus and I was going to have, do, be doing particular kinds of projects that maybe wouldn't comfortably step in line with what their class usually did. But I was able to work with them to make the program what I needed. But still, the library school doesn't teach you everything you need to know. So there were times when I would be long distance calling the map library here and basically saying, you wouldn't believe what I found today, or you wouldn't believe what they've done to me now. And I, at one point I called and said, I'm running a state funded grant to catalog a whole bunch of maps. Can you send me the map cataloging document? It was, so I really relied on the, the expertise of the map librarian here and the map cataloger who was here at the time to get me through the first couple of years. The other thing that I really relied on was, okay, at the University of Illinois Map Library, a map like this would be here in my head. And then I would look in the corresponding place in the collection I was learning because I didn't know the collection that well yet. So I was there for three years. And then in 1988, I drove Interstate 90 coast to coast. That was the year that Yellowstone burned. Uh, so very, very hot drive drive. Um, uh, and I took a position as the map librarian at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, much bigger collection. Um, at the time, I was just the map librarian, not the map and geography librarian. I eventually became the map and geography librarian. The geography li there was actually a separate geography library uh, that belonged to the university library system, but was located within the department. Um, I went uh, at one point to a state meeting about geographic information science and thought partway through the meeting, given my position at the University of Washington, I should be able to do a better job of conversing about these matters, about being able to have an opinion. Uh, so I um, started taking classes through the geography department and just as a non-matriculated student. And then I applied for their master's program. And the department said to me, eight years as a map librarian should count as something. And so they put me into the PhD program instead, uh, which was really nice. Um, I still am in contact with the, the faculty member who was the chair of my committee. Um, I made it through the exams, you know, but all I'm going to get is a little certificate saying that I'm, you know, all but dissertation. Uh, because the University of Illinois called and, you know, I answered the call. Um, it, it, speaking as a geographer, you know, there are, when you move from one place to another, there are push and pull factors. and. Uh, the pull factors were really strong to, to come back to Illinois. Uh, the, the funny thing is that the position that I hold now um, as Map and Geography Librarian was actually advertised three times. The first time it was advertised, um, I saw the person who had been the Map Librarian at a conference. I had been married for about six months and I was standing waiting to register for a hotel room. And he walked up to me and said, Jenny, I'm, I'm leaving Urbana. Can I put you on a short list? To which I said, but David, we just bought a washer and dryer. <laughs> right before I got on a plane to go to the conference, my husband and I had made a successful offer to purchase a home in the Seattle area. And evidently, my son of home ownership was owning my own washer and dryer. Well, what happened is it was a bad budget cycle that year, and they closed the posting before the applications were due and they didn't fill the job. They didn't even interview. They didn't have money to fill the position with. 
So a little while long, later, the position was advertised again, and I didn't apply. I read the ad, and I remember thinking that the ad was just really strange. I, I didn't think I could do the job the way that it appeared. I don't know what happened that time. And then the third time that it was posted, I received a letter that was nothing but a photocopy of the ad. And on the top, written in pencil was, won't you please apply, JT. JT was John Thompson. He was the faculty member and the undergraduate advisor when I first took that Geography of Illinois class. He was the instructor for that class. He was the undergraduate advisor in the Geography Department. And when I came for the interview, it felt as if he had let the Geography faculty know where I was and what I was doing because it felt very much like old home week. Mm -hmm. So it was just, it took three times and it was really interesting. It, there was a five year gap between my predecessor's departure and my arrival. And every time I went to a National Library Association conference and sat and talked with other map librarians, there was a lot of, does anyone know what's going on in Urbana? It was like nothing. It was just, and so, you know, I know what happened, why, why the position wasn't filled the first time. I have no idea what happened that second time. And then the third time, um, my husband and I were truly ready to leave Seattle. Um, the University of Illinois in Urbana is located halfway between where my parents were living and where he grew up and where his parents were living. And it just seemed to be the right time to move back to the Midwest. So um, I started in February of 97. Um, while I was at a conference that summer, my husband applied for and was interviewed and did the paperwork to start a grant-funded job at the University Library. My husband and I used different last names. And so we've had some very funny experiences like the head of library HR looking at Tom's paperwork and saying, oh, this is really interesting. You're from the Effingham area. Maybe you know our new map librarian's husband. <laughs> and this happened more than once the first few years that he was working for the library. People didn't quite put us together. And then they started making the connections. And so I'd be sitting in a committee meeting and his name would come up and everyone could kind of swivel. And I'm like, yeah, that's my husband. You know, it, it took a while, but even the university, the university librarian fell into the trap. Um, he was bringing uh, people around, uh, touring the library, and at this point, my husband had an office in the basement of Granger. And the conversation went something like, oh, Tom's office mate has twins. Tom's wife is having twins. And then the university librarian very excitedly saying, this is really exciting because our map and geography librarian is having twins. He had no idea that the map and geography librarian <laughs> and Tom's wife were one and the same. So, you know, it, it, there have been funny things like that. Um, but being here, um, being part of the university library, uh, we found it very supportive as parents of a very young family. Um, parents of multiples. Uh, Tom's boss was, direct boss was Bill Michaud, who has retired recently as being head of the Granger Engineering Library. And uh, Bill uh, made it possible for my husband to work from home before that was a thing. Hmm. Uh, you just, um, we had an incredible amount of help, you know, both from individuals within the university library and University Library as a whole um, to to raise a young family. Uh, I don't think we would have done as well as parents as we had with without the help of the organization, and uh, we are really indebted to individuals um, for stepping up and letting us know it was okay to be parents, um, to go and take care of other things that were more important than what was going on at the library then and there. So um, I'm really glad that I'm here. I, I really truly have the job that I wanted uh, when I was a senior in college. Um, I don't think there are many people who can say that that happened. Uh, 
unfortunately, you I had to leave and then come back. I was I was gone for about eleven years. Um, I would not have known enough to run the map library here right out of library school. Mm -hmm. And generally, if you're in map librarianship, um, you're often the only person at your college or university who does what you do. And so in order to be promoted, you do need to move from institution to institution and institution or ever to a bigger collection or a collection with a bigger reputation. Um, we'd been here for a few years and my husband did really ask me, what's next? Mm -hmm. I'm like, he said, Library of Congress. I'm like, no, I've already done the, the, the Washington DC thing. I don't want to do it again. Um, you know, we couldn't think of any other place to be. This is really where we wanted to be. And that's how you've been here for 25, 25 years. 25 years. I just got the email earlier this week that, yeah, when they do the honoring longevity at the university, I don't know what else to call it, uh, next spring that my name is on the list. So Congrats. 25 years. Wow. Yeah, yeah. The thing that I find very interesting about your story is that first, obviously, is that you had <clears throat> this job that you wanted, mm -hmm. and then you were really certain, and then years passed and everything, and then you got the job. Uh -huh. And the other thing that I find really interesting about your story is that you took this class, you had this intuition that you really wanted to do this mm -hmm. thing, you didn't know where it was gonna lead, right. you didn't know whether it was a good job, a good future, mm -hmm. you didn't know mm -hmm. any of that. Mm -hmm. However, you st still took the leap of yeah. faith, yeah. which is something that, you know, I'm sure, I don't know how, how times were, where, you know, and I don't know, in the, I think you were in the 70s or so, right? Yeah, so, so I changed my major in August of 83. 83. Uh, finished my, oh, August of 82. Sorry, I skipped a year. <laughs> um, so 82, 83, 83. Finished my bachelor's degree in 84. Um, finished my master's degree in 85. So, and that was, that was kind of interesting because I was 22 when I finished my master's degree and here I am, my first job being the boss in the library and I had people working for me who were older than I was. That was interesting. Um, I made it work, I made it work. Um, but you know, it was, I didn't know how to negotiate a contract. I didn't know how to say, no, I'm worth more money than you're offering. Right. I was just thrilled to be working in a map library. And the um, Graduate School of Geography at Clark University is very highly regarded. Um, and so, you know, here I am, you know, straight out of the door, you know, I've got this cool job. I was paid so well that I could afford to live with undergraduates in the apartment clusters. It's a lot of luxury, yeah. Yeah, it was real luxury. Um, in New England, there is a particular housing type called a three-decker, where it's basically three flats, one on top of each other. They have all exactly the same floor plan. Right. Um, it's uh, a frame building um, with plaster walls on the interior. And virtually, it's, it's plaster and lath construction. Um, uh, no central heat. Um, your heat is a parlor stove and half of your stove oven appliance is a heating unit. Um, single pane windows. And this is central Massachusetts. It gets pretty cold. Uh, it, we had a space heater and we would figure out what order we were going to bed and we would pass the space heater around to heat up our bedrooms one at a time. So yeah, I was paid well enough. Um, first two years I lived with three undergraduate roommates and then the third year um, I and two of the ones that I'd lived with the previous two years, we moved to a different place. Never ever do a move that is basically down the street and around the corner. Those are the most difficult moves because it doesn't really pay to load your stuff up into a car and drive. So we walked everything down and around the corner. It, it was a hard move. Um, it, the first apartment wasn't ready when I moved to Worcester. 
um, my mom and one of her sisters drove me out um, to, to central Massachusetts from the Chicago area. And the apartment wasn't ready. So I lived with my boss, who was the director of the Graduate School of Geography, um, for probably the first two weeks of the semester or the first two weeks of my being there. I don't remember anything about those two, first two weeks. I think I was so stressed that that time just doesn't exist. I don't remember anything before living in the apartment. Mm. So I don't really, I can't really tell you what the start of the job was like. Um, but uh, I had nice roommates. Um, I had no social life um, because there was no way as a university employee I could go to a student party. Mm with the chance of there being underage drinkers or drug use or anything like that. So it was a very, very lonely three years. And um, I'd, I'd come home for Christmas and then I'd go back and I'd always be back before my roommates because they had, you know, winter break. <laughs> I had six days of vacation. And so I'd always be back before they would be, and I'd come in, and the apartment would be cold. The first couple hours, I would stay in my coat while I was waiting to warm up, and I would usually just sit and cry because I would be so lonely. You, know, I, I, I don't think I'd ever experienced that kind of loneliness before. And even though, even when my roommates were back, there was still a particular kind of loneliness because I really. I didn't really have peers in the geography department. They were all faculty. I was just staff. Um, and, and the librarians who were in the main library, they were all older than I was. And so um, my part of the phone bill was usually pretty big. And um, you know, so I, I dated the guy who became my husband long distance uh, for about four or five years, the three years in, in Worcester and then a couple years at, in Seattle. And um, we'd spend two, two and a half hours on the phone at a, at a time. And we just, I don't even know what we talked about, talked about nothing. Um, but it was kind of a lifeline. Right. Um, you know, this is back in the era where you, you called your parents on Sunday and the only time you called them in any other time was if there was really, really good news or really, really bad news, you know, as, and so to, to spend that kind of money. And he would write these really long letters. Um, I had been at Clark for about six months when he started working for Boeing in Seattle. And he wrote me a long letter, very bored during new employee onboarding complete with a very detailed sketch of his pocket protector and everything that was in it. I still have the letter <laughs> with the drawing. You know, it's just, but we, long letters, um, letters on so many pieces of paper, you had to have them weighed at the post office to get the right amount of postage on them. And there were times when he didn't put enough postage on, so I had to pay the mailman before he would give me my mail. But, um, you know, it's just, he, you, you do what you need to do. Um, he did ask me to marry him while I was at Clark, and I told him no. Um, I told him that I needed to prove to myself that I could do this on my own before I took care of myself with the assistance of someone else. And he basically said, okay, well, uh, when you're ready, you can ask me. So uh, I ended up in Seattle. Uh, he had left Boeing by that point to go to graduate school at Purdue. He returned to Seattle. Um, and I kind of did my best to <laughs> hint around because I was like, how am I going to explain to my parents that I had to ask him? And uh, we uh, rented a rowboat, kind of, there was a city park on the south end of Lake Washington. We rented a rowboat and we were out in the middle of Lake Washington. He basically said to me, well, will you? <laughs> so, you know, it's just, you know, we, we, we finally got back together. But it was, you know, it's kind of like, we're here, I'm here, he's there, he's here. I'm here. 
you know, it, it, you know right. it, it took about five years for us to finally get into the same place. And then was the University of Washington job like random or, 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 or you plan it to be the same? I had not planned to be in Seattle. Um, I knew that um, there was going to be a point at which it was time for me to leave Clark. And I had been there for about a year and a half when I started to apply for other jobs. And there had been a job at the University of Minnesota that I applied for. Um, I didn't, I think I was like one below where they were able to afford to bring people into interview. And then um, I had active applications at both the University of Washington in Seattle and the University of Arizona in Tucson. And um, I was at a, one of these big American Library Association meetings and uh, a former MAP librarian who had gone back and gotten his PhD in library and information science and was then on the faculty at the University of Arizona Library School. Uh, he walked up to me and he knew that I had the application open at Arizona. He looked at me and said, Jenny Marie, I don't think Tucson is the place for you. Well, you know, I'm a fair hair, fair skin, blue eyed Scandinavian, and uh, I would have had to become a night, a night crawler because uh, the sun would have been too much for me in Tucson. Um, and it was really funny at the University of Washington, I, I had an application open there, and I got uh, a call from them, and uh, it was it was one of these kind of odd thanks, but no thanks. And um, the person who was calling from library administration uh, called to encourage me. He said um, they had a really hard time deciding who they were going to bring in. And he said, um, here's who we are bringing in but you came really, really close, and we wanted to tell you this so that you weren't discouraged. And I was like, okay, fine, thank you very much. And I figured, well, at this point, I'll be at Clark for a while longer, so maybe I should work on a history degree or a different kind of geography degree, you know, something. So I'd kind of put that into motion. And then I got another call from the University of Washington and somebody had declined the interview or had dropped out of the pool. And so they wanted to see me. And this sounds stupid, but you know, at the inter interview they always say, now do you have any other questions for us? My one question at the University of Washington was, so, does the city of Seattle own any snow removal equipment? <laughs> you know, my, my mental map is Seattle's way up here. And my parents are from northern Minnesota. I know what the snow like is like there. And I was told basically, no, it never snows in Seattle. Well, that was a lie. Um, it does snow in Seattle, and they just can't really deal with it very well. Um, but that was my only question. Does it snow? Dumb, right? Um, I think that when I had gotten ready that morning, I had watched local news and the weather forecast was really interesting because at sea level, it was not snowing, but up in the mountains it was. And I thought, okay, I'm a flatlander because to me, if it's snowing, it's snowing every Everywhere. place. Here, it's different depending on your elevation. So that's probably why I asked. Um, and even with the dumb question, they still hired me. So, but it was you know, eight years there. Um, I made some good friends out there. Actually, they were my husband's legacy friends from the first time he worked at Boeing. Um, he kind of bequeathed me his friend group, mm. which, which was good um, because I had some place to go or someone to be with on the weekends. Um, I, you know, we moved away and it's funny. Um, in my mind, I know there's no way that their kids can be little still, but the last time I saw their kids, you know, they were six, seven years old at the very most. And in my mind, their kids are still six or seven years old. And no, it's that plus 25. So their kids have kids now. So it's, um, it, it was interesting moving back. Uh, most of this friend group that my husband had made uh, the first time he worked for Boeing, 
uh, a lot of them were from Michigan, and they had gone all gone to um, Michigan Tech University up on the Upper Peninsula. And they were really funny when I, we moved back here um, because they were like, ooh, tornadoes. <laughs> and I'm like, tornadoes have a season. Earthquakes happen any time of the year. See, I hadn't grown up with the thought of earthquakes. Um, I, I still, after being out in Seattle for eight years, I still do know where my shoes are in case there's an <laughs> earthquake. Um, you know, but yeah, they, they were all used to thinking about earthquakes. You know, there aren't that many tornadoes, you know, that you know, hit northern Michigan. Um, to them, you know, the big risk was tornadoes. I'm like, it's kind of all in what you're used to. You know, I know what to do in a tornado. I don't know if I would know what to do for certain if there was an earthquake. A major one, not a gentle roller. Um, but it's, um, they're, they're just, it's kind of funny memories, you know, those things that, you know, people have asked or said, you know, when you're making a transition from one place to mm -hmm. another. Um, when I, I was pregnant in, with twins, um, I was talking with a member of the geography department here at the U of I, and I don't think we knew yet that we were having girls. And so, you know, we needed a working title, right? <laughs> so in conversation, I referred to the babies as lat, latitude, and long, longitude. The faculty member, I think, thought that was really what their names were going to be. No, these are the working titles. We don't know what we're having yet. But it was it was just kind of like you know, his his instant, right. you know. <laughs> so you yeah, had to put that to rest. No, we did not name our daughters after geographical coordinates concepts. It would have been a good name. It, it yeah, like it would have been. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. it, it would have made a, made sense, right? Um, but no, that. <laughs> <laughs> didn't happen. Um, I'm not even certain now which one I was thinking of as Latin, which one was long. <laughs> uh, it's just, um, I, I can make a guess, but I, I don't know if that's what it really was or not. <laughs> I love how you describe like these old times and like you're, you're mentioning like the social life. I feel really ancient now. No. Old <laughs> times. <laughs> uh, it's still like, it's funny, like you're describing the campus, right? Uh, and it's, it, there are similarities, but there are also so many differences in how, yeah. you, how you say it. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is I was gone for 11 years. And I came back, and in that time, the Granger Engineering Library had been built. Oh, it wasn't when... Mm. Oh, no. Um, in fact, when I left here, I think that Bill Michaud, who became the Granger Engineering Librarian, who, who was the head of Granger. We have Granger because of Bill's work. Um, I don't know if he, his office was still a refurbished janitorial closet in the old engineering hall or not. It was just, there was no space for the engineering library in engineering hall. The, the, the Granger Engineering Library was an absolute critical thing for the College of Engineering. But when I came back and I went north of Green, I was completely lost. <laughs> I couldn't find the buildings. That's because they were all gone. Uh, the building that um, my CS101 section had been taught in, that had been pulled down to make way for the Granger Engineering Library. And there had been two other buildings right in the center of the engineering quad. They were gone too. And it just, it, it was really disorienting to come back and some parts of campus, no problem. I actually remembered how to get to the map library on my first day of work, not having been here for a long time. Nothing had changed. And then I went north of Green and it was completely different. And um, I actually had to go back and look at air photos and old maps of campus to, to, to kind of convince myself that I wasn't crazy in thinking that there should have been a different building or there should have been a building there. Um, we, we still have, we do have a photo in the collection that isn't cataloged um, because I can't figure out when it was flown. 
an air photo. Mm -hmm. It's taken um, as if the plane or the helicopter, whatever the, fo the camera was in, uh, was on or above University Avenue looking south. Right. And I can date it to within three or four years based on you know, the baseball diamond is here, and um, they haven't pulled down the ham radio shack, and, you know, there are buildings on the engineering quad, and, you know, something else hasn't been built, and the psychology building is there, and, oh, the parking lot is different. You know, I can kind of ballpark it, right. but I feel like I'm missing an essential piece, and so every once in a while I just kind of go back, and I make my list of all the changes, and it's like, okay, it has to be, after this point, but before this point, just can't quite get mm. the gap narrowed far enough. I haven't found the right thing to look for yet. I, I need to go uh, visit you, and so I, I really would like to see the the picture yeah. of the like the the Granger mm -hmm. like instead of the Granger Library, all those mm -hmm. buildings. So mm -hmm. I, I I would have a really hard time. Yeah. Just so new. the building that was pulled down when Granger was built. Was built. I'm gonna. I have to ballpark it somewhere, probably between 1897 and 1901, 1902. It was one of the oldest buildings on campus, and it obviously had outlived its usefulness. Um, so you know, it's you know, the the change has to come. Um, you know, they they recently. Um, refurbished Davenport Hall, which was originally the home of the College of Agriculture, and that's why it still says College of Agriculture right. across the front. There used to be a stock ring in that building. And then in about 1950, the geography department became a separate entity. It had been part of a combined geology geography department in about 1950. It became its own thing. And Davenport Hall was being renovated for the use of social sciences. I think they put psychology and maybe sociology, but I'm not certain, and anthropology and geography, all, the, all those people-oriented ologies um, in, in the building. Well, they you know, renovated Davenport, and I'm really happy to say that when I go in there, I still recognize it as the building that I had classes in. Um, the wood floors still kind of snap and pop when you walk on them. Um, the staircase looks different. It used to be very shiny and had a rather dark patina on it. Uh, it it's much blonder. I, I think they, they basically sanded it and, and sealed it. Um, but it still feels like the building that I knew as an undergraduate. Um, you know, the geography department has moved now to the natural history building, which is really interesting because that was where the geology department and actually where the combined geography geology department had been located. Mm -hmm. So the geography has kind of returned to its original place on, on campus. Um, when they renovated the natural history building, uh, there had been a geology library in there. Um, the geology books went to the Oak Street remote facility, library uh, storage facility, or to the Granger Engineering Library. There had been a map collection as part of the geology library, which was in the basement. Um, and uh, as we worked with it to figure out how to deal with it, we discovered that there were it had an insect infestation. Um, mm. Silverfish, in particular, really like paper, and there were silverfish. So um, instead of doing a graceful move of the materials, um, everything was strapped onto pallets and loaded into a freezer truck, um, and then frozen for a month, brought up to ambient temperature, and then just dropped into map cases at Oak Street. And so we're still dealing with that. But as uh, one of the things that also pushed the move of the library out and other occupants of the building out as quickly as possible is they discovered that when the floors had been poured, um, there had not been put enough, not enough rebar had been put into the floor and the floors were sagging. And so um, down in the basement, if you opened up particular doors, you could look out into the hallway and see architectural sized 
carjacks. They look like giant carjacks, and they've just been put in, cranked up, told the ground floor up. <laughs> it's like I'd never seen anything like that before. And it was a little off-putting to be in that space trying to figure out what to do with maps. I just didn't even want to be in the building knowing that there were floor jacks. Um, but we, uh, we don't know how many maps were really in the collection. And I know that we went through and we did due diligence and there were things in the geology map collection that we had in the map library's collection. And so we didn't keep duplicates because we just didn't have the space to store them. Um, I could go back and I could tell you how many maps we discarded, but I don't know how many maps were frozen and dropped into drawers at Oak Street. Hmm. So, you know, people ask me, you know, how big is the map library? Um, I can say for the map library, the things that are on the fourth floor of the main library or that were moved out of the main library collection in into Oak Street, yeah, it's about 630,000 map sheets. Many more, though, if you add in the maps um, from uh, the geology library. So I tell people that be because I and my staff are responsible for providing access to those geology maps, that we're stewarding about three quarters of a million pieces. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a huge collection. Um, the funny thing, so I said that the geology maps were in the basement. The map library here is in a very odd location. It's on the fourth floor of a 1927 building. <laughs> Not typical. Usually map libraries are at or below grade. So on the first floor, on the ground floor, or in the basement. And this is because the floor load is so great. So if you think about construction and you have your typical house load and then heavier than that is office load and heavier than that is library load like books, books on shelves and heavier than that, map libraries. Really? And the pounds per square foot is going to depend on how high you have your map cases stacked. Well, no one's been able to explain to me exactly why we can be on the fourth floor. Uh, whenever I take a new job, I, within the first couple of weeks, I try to sit down and I read from the very earliest one every single annual report about the unit that I can find. And in the early 1960s, the library did bring in a structural engineer and paraphrasing the annual report, he says, I guess it works. Uh, the fourth floor of the main library building is constructed differently. So I'm talking about the oldest part of the building that you, that part that is, you can see if you were standing on top of the, what is now the former undergraduate library, that east facade, built in the early to mid 1920s. Um, if you were to look at it floor by floor, in the basement, and there are pillars. On the first floor, I think there are pillars. It's been a while since I've been in the social science library in what's now called the orange room. I cannot remember for certain. You go onto the second floor, and that is the beautiful two-story reading room. The, the, the room that I've heard you know, the, the backwards walking tour guides um, tell potential students about that they go there to study because they feel like they are at the university when they are in their space. Beautiful two-story space, not a single pillar to be seen. And then on top of that is the fourth floor with the map library. Well, it turns out that the fourth floor is suspended by the roof girders. It doesn't rely on the external walls of the building for its structural integrity. I was told many years ago that if I needed to add more map cases, to put them as close to the roof girder as possible because that's where the floor was the strongest. Not really, you know, confidence building there. 
But now with this whole program of no more undergraduate library, uh, converting the former undergraduate library into a space for the rare books and manuscript library, the Illinois History and Lincoln Collection Library and University Archives, means that other spaces are potentially being freed up. I don't know if I'll still be with the university on the day that they move the map library off, but I'm anticipating that they will take all the maps and the map cases off and there will be a rebound of the floor kind of coming back up because it's no longer holding all that weight. That's what I'm anticipating happening, kind of like glacial re rebound in, in northern, U um, northern North America. I don't know. It's a lot of weight. Um, there used to be a reference desk. Actually, people would sit at a desk with a credenza collection right behind them. A credenza collection in a library is that collection that you use often. So this is pre-internet web-based stuff. And the first couple years, um, I came back to run the map library. And you know, I have really juvenile sense of humor. I'd actually go in and I'd kind of look at the ceiling and creep those librarians out. I said, just checking to make sure that we aren't going to be coming to visit you anytime soon. <laughs> and it would just go. But there's no sign. There's no <laughs> crack in the ceiling. You know, it's, it, it's stable. It's sturdy up there. It's just odd. Um, and no one can really tell me. I have not been able to find thus far um, any recording of discussion about this would be a good place for the map library. Uh, the map library was founded in 1944, um, so many years after the building was built. There had been maps and atlases in the university library collection, but they had been scattered. Uh, so the map library existed kind of as just as a map library for about six years. And then in 1950-51, uh, the name was changed to Map and Geography Library. And then we started, you know, housing not just the maps and the atlases and eventually air photos, but also materials to support the research and instruction of the geography department. Um, we were the map and geography librarian when I worked um, there as a student. And when I came back to be unit head, and then through a series of unfortunate fiscal events, um, uh, mostly um, unsupported mandates for increase in minimum wage. The minimum wage increase wasn't the unfortunate part. The unfortunate part was it wasn't supported. I didn't. I didn't get extra money in my student budget when the minimum wage went up. Uh, we could no longer afford to be open evenings and weekends. And that's not the way to serve a departmental library. So I had to make an executive decision. And it was a hard decision. Um, but uh, we became just the map library again. The geography materials a number of years ago were moved out of the map library, either into the social science library into main stacks or into the Oak Street remote storage facility. Um, it, it, kind of, it, it kind of hurt um, in here, in my heart, and in my head too, because I had gotten used to being able to see the new economic geography materials that I had ordered, because they were coming and they were sitting on the shelf in the library I ran. I was, I, was, I was used to seeing the historical geography materials. I was used to seeing you know, the physical geography materials. You know, all of these things I was buying for the department, I was doing kind of, I almost felt like remote control again. It was very much the way I had done things at Clark University at the University of Washington, ordering stuff and never seeing it. So I, I was eventually able to get back into working in that mode. But the first year or so, I have to say I wasn't really happy about it. I felt as if I was not seeing everything that I should have been able to see. Um, so all of the stuff that would correspond to research and instruction in the geography department got moved out, which left the map library with, of course, the maps and the atlases, aerial photography of the state of Illinois, but written works on 
uh, the art and science of cartography, map reading and interpretation, history of cartography, uh, remote sensing, air photo interpretation, um, place names, map librarianship, um, Carto bibliographies, which are bibliographies of maps and atlases. I have to say I'm probably the only person in the last 25 years to use any of those. And geographic information science, as well as spatial statistics. Um, so if you were one of my librarian colleagues responsible for purchasing materials for an area, say archaeology, I would assume that if there is a book about the use of geographic information science or geographic information systems in archaeology, that you're going to buy it. The stuff that I buy as far as GIS is more GIS as discipline. Right. Um, it's a bit more hardcore. Um, I buy the stuff about database. I buy the stuff about error. I, it's, I buy the stuff about ethics in GIS. You know, that's the stuff I buy and I let GIS as applied to a field be picked up by someone else. I have bought GIS as applied to health, health science, health services, um, because there was no one at the time who was buying that kind of material. This was pre-Carl College of Medicine. Um, and I've just kind of continued to buy that stuff. It sits right next to the Atlas of Disease. So, but it's just like, it's a very narrow way of, of thinking about GIS, GIS as discipline. Um, I also maintain the spatial statistics in the map library um, because a lot of that stuff is really core to GIS. Um, because I think at the time I was probably the only person in the university library who had had any spatial statistics courses. So it's just, you know, there were some things that I had to keep because they were, they were tightly uh, wound together. Um, it's, it's worked okay uh, to refocus that way. Um, every once in a while I still wish I could see the, the really cool geography thing that I bought. Um, and the problem is I order it and then it gets sent to some other unit and I don't remember to go back and look to see if it's been received. And so every once in a while I'm surprised that what we have elsewhere and it's like, oh yeah, I do remember ordering that. I've just never seen it. And if I haven't seen it, I don't remember it. Mm. Um, the maps, uh, um, what can I say? We are the University of Illinois. We are one of the biggest map libraries in the United States. Um, the, the map library in the University of Illinois you know, on the fourth floor uh, were a 19th, 20th, and now 21st century collection. Um, Pre-19th century materials, for the most part, are going to either be in the rare book and, special, rare book and manuscript library right. or in the Illinois History and Lincoln Collection Library. Um, I do have fine facsimiles of some pre-19th century materials. Uh, in one case, I, I bought it because this was the only way to have it. Um, it's, a, it's a fine facsimile of a manuscript atlas at the British Library. In other cases, I bought them because I needed those reference images. We have the real thing in the rare book room but they're very security conscious. I can't just walk in and say, I want to look at this, or I can't just send someone down to the rare book room on the third floor and have them say, Jenny said, I need to see this. And so there are some things that I've bought facsimiles of um, because I needed to have those images at hand. And in some cases, um, I've had undergraduates in particular who have come in They've wanted to use those 16th or 17th century images, but they weren't comfortable with the idea of handling the real thing. And I'm like, okay, we can get you in the door with a facsimile. And so, you know, it's worked out pretty well. Um, we have air photos for the state of Illinois, about 180,000 of them, flown between 1935 and 2005. Um, we are very indebted to my predecessor. 
Um, he was an excellent scrounger. He always had his ear to the ground, and he knew when a county had a brand new set of photos, and so he'd be on the phone to like county extension agents and saying, I know you have new photos, can I have your old photos? So a lot of our collection prior to 1988 um, were gifts, um, and they've been used in the field. They've been marked with crayon and ballpoint pen and felt to pen and some of them you hold them up to light and you see pinholes turn them over and there are all these measurements drawn in you can really see how the materials were used um, starting in 1988 the way that photos for the state of illinois were flown uh, was different instead of being a and we're flying Champaign County this year, and we're flying Peoria County this year, and we're flying this county this year, and we'll do this county next year. It was a statewide set. And it takes about 9,000 photos to cover the entire state of Illinois. Um, it's pretty less. It's, it's, it's four very full filing cabinet drawers full of photos. <laughs> and these are stereo pairs, so they overlap. And so you can look at them through stereo glasses and kind of see 3D. Um, they're at a slightly smaller scale than the county by county ones, um, but still they're, they're used quite a bit um, uh, to look at erosion, um, to look at, oh, well, my grandfather had a farm, um, to look at urban development. Um, we haven't bought photos since 2005, um, uh, in large part because uh, kind of technology changed and now they're much more easily available just as digital files. Um, but we've got the, the old things, um, which when my husband and I bought a house, you know, we made an offer on Sunday and on Monday I was in the map library looking at air photos of the property to kind of see if I could figure out what had happened, you know, why was the property so odd. Um, you know, we get a lot of use like that. Um, we welcome people from the community to come in and use photos. Um, if you were to look at our website, we have scanned all the indexes to the air photo set and there should be a link to a web form so you can actually request the photos that you want us to retrieve from the collection uh, via the web form. And then at that point, we'll negotiate about what ne happens next. For most people who are local, we pull them, we put them underneath our circulation desk, and then people can come in, use them in the library. We have a really nice flatbed scanner that will do up to 11 by 17. We just ask that people bring a flash drive to save their image files to, because library IT has locked the machine down so you can't send things out. So you need to bring a flash drive. If you're not here in campus, on campus, or in the immediate community, and it's hard for you to get here, um, we'll kind of do a deal. We're willing to scan five or six photos um, really fast, put them in a box folder. You know, we'll do it for free. Um, after that, if it's a huge amount, uh, we might need to send them down the hall to the library's digitization services, where they will charge. Um, but you'll get a really nice product. Um, if you're willing for us to wait, we'll scan them as we're able to get to them. You know, we'll, we'll do what we can. We'll, um, it's, it's really nice to have the indexes available online um, because I don't have the staff uh, numbers for someone to be able to call and say, I'm sending you an email with a scan of a map attached and I want all the photos for that area. I, I'm not staffed to be able to do that. Uh, and so um, now people can do their index, their own index work, and it doesn't matter where they're located. Uh, so it's, it's one of the great things that we've been able to do. Um, we're scanning a lot of our maps. I did not bring a Sanborn fire insurance map. Um, those are a continuous process. Um, as, as MAPS new sets roll into the public domain each year on January 1st. So uh, this coming January 1st, I think it's 1927 publications will run into, roll into the public domain. And as soon as possible, we will open the doors to those 1970, 1927 uh, sets. We've been scanning them since March, getting ready for the start of 2023. And then starting in spring of 2023, we will start scanning the 1928 Sanborn so that they're ready for the next January. So we're doing that. 
Um, we have an amazing collection of railroad maps scanned that I continue to add to. Um, we have a collection of maps from the First World War scanned. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of slow and steady. Um, we, we do try to be very aware of the copyright date. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to put something up and then suddenly have to take it down because we're, we're stepping on the publisher's toes. Um, this coming year, um, we're going to hopefully get up a collection of Civil War maps. Uh, we received an amazing gift from a library friend uh, this earlier this fall, enough funds to purchase a, a huge bird's eye view of Andersonville Prison in Georgia. And I was like, well, geez, maybe now is the time to start thinking about scanning our Civil War maps. So we're going to do Civil War maps. We also have a small number of maps published in the 1920s of a wide variety of topics um, that I think we're going to put up a 1920s collection. So maps showing Lindbergh's flight, 1928. But we also have a map published in Japan in 1925 that is celebrating the flight of two Japanese pilots who took off from Tokyo and flew to cities in Europe. You know, these are things that we don't hear about right. in our typical history class in the United States. I had no idea. And so it's like when I saw this, I'm like, oh, something to balance out Limburg. And <laughs> so when I buy materials, I'm always hoping that I can kind of find you know, the counterpart in the collection, or I will buy something and then I will look for the counterpart. So we'll be putting up a odd selection of 1920s stuff. We have, um, uh, I work with um, very generous colleagues. Of maps kind of sell themselves. So I will email one of my colleagues and say, hey, I'm interested in getting this map for the collection. Can you help me buy it with your funds? And more often than not, they say yes. And sometimes they say, I'll buy the whole thing for you, which is great. So that's wonderful. We also have a small but growing number of devoted library friends who have stepped up over and over again to help us purchase um, materials. Uh, I, have, I have one gentleman in particular who loves railroads. And so I will hear from him directly, what are you looking for? And I, I will send him a list. Here's, here's what's on my wish list as far as railroads go. Um, I, there's another couple who uh, assisted us in purchasing um, a really interesting uh, map, strip map of the Mississippi River, uh, basically from St. Louis down to the mouth from 1863, and it shows all of the different fortifications. Um, they've recently helped us purchase a map uh, showing from, from 1835, I think it is, showing the area where the Illinois-Michigan Miss Canal would eventually be built. It doesn't actually show the canal, but it shows this wide swath of land on either side of the Illinois River coming from Lake Michigan westward. And so they've assisted us with that. So we, we have some uh, devoted library friends. Um, library Advancement, which is the office that works with library friends, has uh, on their web page something called Libraries Looking For. And in, it also appears partially every time they send out Friendscript, which is their kind of library friends newsletter. And so I and other librarians um, will receive an email. Do you have anything for libraries looking for? I always have something for libraries looking for. I have a well-curated Excel spreadsheet of everything that I see map dealers offering that I want for the collection. So I always have something to put up on that. But it's, it's amazing. Um, I am always surprised at uh, the fact that people find this interesting. And I guess um, people, people are really excited about maps. And um, 
sometimes they come and visit the map that they help us purchase, which is always a lot mm -hmm. of fun. Right. Uh, uh, last week I had an emeritus faculty member and his wife come, come in. They had a map that his uncle had received in the mail from like Farm Journal magazine uh, when his uncle was 14. And his uncle received it in 1918. It was a map of the Western Front. And so they came, they actually came in last Thursday on, on Veterans Day. And um, so what else am I going to pull out for Armistice Day but First World War maps? And so we had a lovely time looking at First World War maps. And um, the really neat thing about this map that they gave us, it's in pristine condition. It's paper cover is still attached, and they still had the envelope that the original recipient received it in, in the mail. And so we've got this whole package, which is really neat because it demonstrates how people in the United States were learning about what was going on in Europe. And that's part of the story of the First World War, just as much as the maps of the Western Front. And so, you know, it's, I'm, I'm always looking for something like that. So, we should look at maps, right? Yes. Okay. Um, where, I brought, where do you want to start? I am happy to start with whatever is on top of my stack here. So let's look at this first. This is a teeny tiny thing. This is a map that would have, someone would have picked up. See, it's, it's actually a uh, advertisement piece for this Chicago company that built scales. Hmm. It's advertising. Here's more stuff that they sell. And on the inside is this crazy map of the 1893 Columbian Exhibition. And when I looked at this, um, my first comment was, I wish I was still TAing that class at the University of Washington that was a cartography class. And the faculty member's favorite assignment was find a bad map in the map library and write a two-page paper about it. And this would have been an ideal <laughs> candidate for a bad map because you've got all this teeny tiny print, these crazy lists with three-digit numbers, and you need to figure out which line attaches to which location on the map. Mm -hmm. So um, we have not yet scanned a collection of World's Fair maps, but we certainly have uh, maps from the 1893 fair. We ha also have maps from the 1933 map fair, which I have a particular connection to. Uh, when I was in high school and studying cello, um, the gentleman that I studied with was a member of the Chicago Symphony. But as a young man, he played for Sally Rand, who was a fan dancer. And he played Sansons the Swan as she danced with fans. Nothing on behind the fans, nothing. I think she had on a leotard. But you know, there was the whole, you know, will she drop a fan? Uh, he told me that she never ever dropped a fan. Um, I have found pictures of Sally Rand with her fans, and it was, you know, a publicity shoot for the 1933 fair. I have never seen a picture of her with her cellist, which I'm very sad about. But uh, I, I still look. Every once in a while I get onto Google and I, I'm kind of creepy and I look for him. Um, he's hard to find because um, he was named after an uncle who was a violinist, and I usually end up seeing stuff about his uncle more than I end up seeing about him. So the World's Fair. Um, most of the materials that, <laughs> this is serious scholarship, don't laugh. No, I um, love it. <laughs> most, most of the ter materials that um, the I um, have in the map library, I purchase using state funds or funds from colleagues or from library friends. Every once in a while though, like on this one, um, I'll just get out my own credit card because I know I'm never going to buy anything from that particular dealer again. So this is a copy of the January 8th, 1973 uh, Black Panther Jungle, actually it's Jungle Action featuring the Black Panther. And the reason that I wanted this is way in the back here. Here we have a map of Wakanda. 
this is serious cultural literacy. Um, and you know, I'm going to pick this stuff up. The Library of Congress does this. They, they, in fact, they actually, we beat them. On Monday, we had a post up for about this hours before the Library of Congress had their Wakanda map posted. And, but their Wakanda map, they had two copies from two different publications, and the Librarian of Congress was holding them. So big deal. Um, <laughs> there's a, a major historical map collection at the University of Southern Maine called the Osher Map Library. I saw the head of the collection a couple weekends ago at an event, and I said something about having this, and she said, oh yeah, we've got those too. So I'm not the only one buying this stuff, um, but I think this is important. Um, we also have picked up the brand new Wakanda Atlas, and we also have, I think it came out last year, I can't quite, quite remember the title, something like Marvel Universe Map by Map or something like that. Mm. Why not? You, know, you have that? Yes, we have that. You know, why not have a good time with this? You know, I, I can go home and I can say to my husband, yeah, I looked at the cartoon book, you know, looked at the comic book map today, and he just thinks it's silly. Uh, when our daughters are really young, you know, four or five years old, they greet me at the end of the day, they greet me at the back door, hi, Mommy, how was your day? And I could usually say it was a good day because I had looked at interesting things, beautiful objects, people with interesting questions. Let's see. Um, I don't, we may need to take these out of here. I don't know what the glare is going to be. This is a set of six postcards, which when I purchased them from a postcard dealer in Belgium, they came in their original envelope. These were published in 1914 very early in the First World War. Right. And they're showing where the front was on different days. And this dude with the flat cap is obviously French. And this guy with the, I think they were actually called Kaiser Helmets, um, is German. Um, you know, I, I'm not, I'm buying things for the person I don't know. I'm buying things on the off chance that someone is going to want to look at pictorial depictions of the early front um, in, in the First World War. Um, I'm buying them um, thinking that um, someone someday might come in and see this is, this is series one. I don't know if there was a second set or not. Uh, I would love if I could find out whether there was a second set. Um, the, the funny thing about when I bought these is I had originally seen them on the website of a map dealer uh, in London, and he was asking a price that I could not pay. Then I found them at this Belgian postcard dealer for a lot less money. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it always pays to kind of hunt right. around. Um, but it, when you look at these, you can see this one is a little bit darker. And if you look back here, the back of this one is a little bit darker. Those are the two sides that were actually in contact with the acidic envelope. Oh, wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So you can see. But given their age, they are in amazing condition. Obviously never sent, so I could just so lightly uh, pencil a call number on them. Um, these are one of those things that uh, I will I will bring out anytime I can. We do have other map postcards in the collection. Um, they are all in a photocopy paper box, and they have not yet been cataloged yet. They're part of my cataloging background. Let's see. This is a fairly new acquisition. Uh, this was published in 1954 by the state of Illinois. And here are your maps. Notice there is no fallout in Missouri, Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin. That's because this was published by the state of Illinois, and they were only interested in showing what was going to happen in the state of Illinois if, if bombs fell in Chicago or St. Louis. Um, I have to say, here in Champaign-Urbana, we are not lucky either way. Um, we are uh, within the 100% or, you know, casualty rate. Uh, yeah. So, so it just. What's this red thing? So this red thing is, if the wind was so let's see, 
if the wind, let's see, radioactive debris from the blast will be blown towards Springfield if the wind um, is toward the southwest, in other words, coming out of the northeast. Um, so this, this is depending on wind direction, where is the major debris field going to end up falling? And then, well, here we are, and if Chicago is hit, well, we're within that 100% casualty. Um, so, of, so anyone in, in the 140 miles, they would die, die instantly? I don't know if it would be instantly. I, would, mm. I don't know enough about this, right. but I'm very interested in materials published in the United States during the Cold War. Um, it's th this is this is kind of one of those time periods that there was a certain kind of messaging happening, right. and I'm I'm very interested in being able to pick up other maps from this era. Um, you know, I remember doing an under the desk drill as a freshman in high school, so that would have been 1976, 77. And that didn't make any sense. That wooden and metal desk wasn't going to help. But I remember doing an under the desk drill. Mm. So, so, you know, we, we buy scary stuff like that. <laughs> um, shortly after I started as the map librarian, I had a faculty member come in, uh, and he was sight impaired. And he was getting ready to retire. And he told me that he felt it was time to become reacquainted with the world. This was a Braille. really, yeah, Braille. This was a really interesting problem because um, after the Second World War, kind of into the 1960s, there had been a lot of work in tactile mapping, in research, and in publication. And then it just all seemed to evaporate. Uh, I finally found this organization, the Princeton Braillus, and they had a huge set of atlases, and we bought almost every single atlas that they, they published. The label on the cover is the only eye-readable text in the entire work. It's all Braille. And then, we go out here, and this is what a tactile map looks like. And when I, sh when I show this to people in the map library, they're never quite certain if they're allowed to touch. And yes, this is to be touched. <laughs> so, you know, you know, I can tell you this is the Illinois River just because, you know, I know the geography of the state. Um, but there, there are maps of Illinois in context of the upper Midwest. Um, I think this uh, looks like interstates, interstates and major highways. Um, there's a map that shows uh, counties, and then in the back, there are a couple maps of the Chicago metro area. Um, a, a lot of people haven't really considered how you would use a map if you couldn't see it. And so, even though I don't think I've ever had anyone come in who was a, a reader of Braille, um, this is one of those things that, you know, we're going to have at the University of Illinois because, in part, we are the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. This is the kind of thing we buy. Um, these kinds of materials, they aren't printed. It's uh, produced more through a, a vacuum setup. Right. So, so it's, this is kind of one of those kind of odd things. I've tried to photograph these. Um, it's really hard. It's really yeah. hard. You, you need to... Um, need some contrast. You need contrast. And so I, I, I pull up the window shades in the map library's reading room turn off the overhead lights, and then I just keep working until I've got enough shadow and I've at a low enough angle that I, I can see the shadow with my camera. So it's, it's a little tricky, um, but I'm really glad that we have these because this is one of those things that, counties, um, that people don't really think about. Mm. Um, and people have never 
Uh, sometimes I show this to people and they've never seen Braille. They, they, really? they know what it is, but they've never actually seen it. And so, um, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, a good piece uh, in both ways. Um, knowing that last week we had a major election, uh, so we, we do serious stuff. Um, uh, this atlas, uh, atlas like this, has been published since the 2008 election. So this is 2020, um, when Donald Trump was elected, um, and you know it's you know this is pretty serious stuff. Um, oh, Biden, Biden, yeah. Or 2020. Sorry, 20, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. This it's the next thing that that, that has the Trump maps, um, and I haven't spent a lot of time with this. This is one of those things where. Thank goodness there is well-written text that will help you interpret the graphics. Um, so we, we buy stuff like this. Um, there is a cartographer, his name is um, Kenneth Field, and he put this together uh, primarily in response, or in part, partial response to I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Way back here, there is an image of a White House staffer carrying down the hallway um, Donald Trump's favorite map, which is a map that is very difficult to interpret correctly. Yes, it looks as if Donald Trump won because everything is red. This is a better way of depicting the data. So what Ken Field did is he basically went through and mapped the election data 100 different ways. Uh, and then wrote about each method that he employed, what its pros and cons were. Ken is very thoughtful. Um, he has another book out just called Cartography, which I have two copies of, one on our reference shelf and one of our circulation, circulating company circulating collection because he has good examples. He's a very straightforward writer. Um, I will read anything that Ken Field uh, produces. Um, so this is, this is one of those things, again, that I haven't had a chance to really sit down and absorb. Um, right now it's more of a, uh, if you're m mapping a particular kind of data, you need to look at this so that you, you aren't making decisions that will cause uh, your message to be interpreted in a different way. So we do do serious stuff. But then, you know, Star Trek, why not? We actually have two editions of this. The first edition came out in 2013. This is the 2018 edition. Um, this lives in protective custody in the office um, because it has 10 huge maps all of which are reproduced in smaller versions in the book. Um, there was, I think, a little bit of change in the text um, and in how the maps were uh, titled between the first edition and the second edition. Um, but I also have Star Wars, I have Middle Earth, I have Westeros, Pern, and I just supported something on Kickstarter for the Mercedes Lackey universe with the, with the horses. So, um, you know, again, this is cultural literacy. Um, I also buy this stuff in hopes that somebody someday might just kind of be casually Googling Star Trek and they suddenly discover the map library. It's kind of like, you know, come and play maps with me. I mean, it, it's hard because I, a lot of people are, are not looking for it, but uh, it, you, need, you need to find ways to tell to, to find people. Right, right. And so, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah, I'm, I, I can't remember if the record um, actually lists every single um, you know, map that's in the set. But who knows? Maybe someday we'll just, someone will Google Vulcan and, you know, wow. we've, we've got it. So, um, yeah, th this, this is kind of fun stuff. Um, I, I don't know if any of my colleagues 
buy stuff like this. I'm sure they do. Um, but it, it's kind of fun. It's a nice set. Such a nice set. It's a really nice set. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, the person who did the very last map, Dr. Jeffrey Mendel, this, this, is, this is a real person. Um, he has other Star Trek publications. Um, one of his other publications is evidently now on the writer's shelf as part of canon. Um, he did some set design for one of the spin-off series. I can't remember which one. Uh, he Picard? Also, uh, I don't remember if it was Picard or if it was Voyager. Um, I, I just don't remember. And he also did set design for like Parks and Rec. So, you know, he, 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 does, he does that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of fun, you know, it's like, he, he's a real person. So, that's cool. Um, the other thing is that uh, the largest atlas in the map library weighs about 70 pounds. And if you go to the map library's website and get to the part of the website about atlases, there is a picture of this huge blue book with a teeny tiny little red book in its corner. The red book is in here. When I ordered the red book, which is about the size of the sticker, uh, and it came, and I was so excited about this atlas, um, uh, it came in at about 4.30 in the afternoon, and by 5 o'clock, everybody on the fourth floor of the main library, plus everyone on the third floor, had seen it. I was like, look at this. Uh, Ken Field, in his other book, Cartography, identifies this atlas as being the world's smallest world atlas. When it came, it was in a lovely padded envelope, and inside the padded envelope, a Ziploc baggie. And I was so afraid that I was going to lose the Ziploc baggie that I stapled it into a folder. And then I got it cataloged, and I sent it off to our Conservation and Preservation Unit and asked them to build an enclosure so <laughs> I wouldn't lose it on the shelf. Wow. Yeah. So... This is pretty sweet. It's bound in leather and feel. The leather is still very, very soft. The paper is still supple. It has a little bit of gold on the edges of the pages. It's a real book. If you go in here, look, it has a title page. Oops, can't see. So it has a title page and a table of contents and there are blank pages in between because it, that, that's a, an artifact of how the printing was done. Uh, here's a world map, which is following the convention of mapping the British Empire, which basically was you map on a cylindrical projection, a.k.a. Mercator. You make everything, including England, red. And if this was completely following the last big part, and it maybe does, it's just so small you can't see, Quite often, maps of empire, there was a repeat. So usually kind of in the kind of New Zealand, Australia area, you'd see part, the same part on either edge mm -hmm. of the map, which was centered on Greenwich. And that subliminally reinforces the idea of the worldwide empire. So this is an atlas of the British Empire. Um, there is a little map of England, and, my, and my, my fingers are so fat, it's a little hard sometimes to, to turn pages elegantly. So here you have the British Isles with a coat of arms. Um, and then each part of the empire is mapped, and you'll notice there's a teeny tiny England and Wales up here. That's at the same scale as the main maps. You get a sense of how small England really is. And that smallness is disguised by everything, including mm. England being red here. Now the story behind this little atlas is that in the early 1920s in England, uh, there was a group put together to create something called Queen Mary's Doll's House. The doll house still exists. You can see it in Windsor Castle. It had running I've water and electricity when it was first built. It's built at a scale of an inch to a foot. Right. And it's, it's for definitely the gentleman and his family. There's actually a king's bedchamber and a queen's bedchamber. 
And it includes everything that the gentleman and his family would want, including fishing gear and a kitchen with copper pots and a library. The library has real books in it. Uh, British authors were invited to submit a manuscript. And the manuscripts were bound. And they're still in the library. And they are still manuscripts in the author's hand. Uh, there were also reference materials, like the atlas. Um, the collection, uh, everything in the collection has a uh, book plate inside, which had been designed by E.H. Shepard, the illustrator of Winnie the Pooh. And after the doll's house was built, and uh, it, it was to show the quality of British arts and crafts and fabrication, uh, 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 entrance fee uh, went to a charity. Um, there were some small objects that were reproduced and also sold to support charity, and one of them was the little atlas of the British Empire. And so we have this teeny tiny atlas. Um, it just makes me smile. It's it, it just, I think, because of the size. And then imagining an entire library of tiny books. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, just, it's just kind of, it's, it's a, you know, a sweet little piece. Um, by my saying sweet, it, I'm not saying that the British Empire was, you know, really a great thing. But as an artifact of its time, right. um, this, is, this is really an exemplar. So I'm going to put it back in its box so that I can then put the box in my bag when I pack up and I know I haven't lost it. There's uh, a couple in the Rare Manuscript Library in, the, in, the, in Chicago in the Art Museum. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a yeah. couple, I don't know if they have books, but they have... Um, mm -hmm libraries and houses and things. Yeah, yeah. So it's, but you know, when, when you look at, uh, so the, the Art Institute of Chicago has you know, all of the, oh, I can't remember what, you know, it's down in the basement and, and it's kind of like sample rooms. It, it, they don't approach the level of detail mm. that this entire little building has. Now, we do have a book about Queen Mary's Doll's House in Oak Street. And so, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you know, it's just like when I, when I got that, I like right away, it's like, I need to find out about the Doll's House. And there's, a, and there's actually a library, <coughs> real, li uh -huh. real life library, uh, like a miniature. Yeah. In yeah. the Naperville. Naperville. Library yeah. uh, in the main one. So if in you ever happen to be there, yeah. you would like that one. Okay, so. You know, let's Middle just... Middle Earth. Middle Earth, yeah. Um, oh. the, so uh, we haven't had this one very long. Um, I purchased it uh, through Abe Books, A-B-E Books, um, which is kind of like an aggregator. Um, it was sent to us from England. Um, I think that it had probably been rolled in a very small map tube for about 50 years, and it hasn't decided to stay flat. Uh, the reason I wanted this piece is this is the first trade printing in 1970. And it's a really important piece for maps of Middle Earth um, because it was drawn by Pauline Baines in consultation with mm -hmm. J.R.R. Tolkien. Right. He gave this map his blessing. Um, and it's the only one that he played a critical role in producing. Um, I was first introduced to Pauline Baines um, when I read the Narnia Chronicles. She did all the illustrations for Narnia. A couple years after this was published, she did a map of Narnia, and she also, also illustrated an uh, edition of The Wind in the Willows. Um, and everything, you know, you, you look at it and it's like, oh yeah, this is Pauline Baines. Um, she has a very distinctive style. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, this shape here, um, if you were to flip it the other way and then look at a map of Central and Eastern Europe, there is a mountain range that looks square with an open edge. So you, you, you kind of pick up things on things like that. Um, I think that 
this is absolutely charming. This is <laughs> very much in the style that Token himself drew. And so um, yeah, this is just kind of one of those, I'm really excited to have it pieces. Um, I have a number of other maps done much later of Middle Earth, but this is kind of, you know, the map, you know, to have for that kind of collection. So this thing is a printing or a drawing? This is printed. Printed, got mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, yep, yep. So it looks as if Pauline Dain Baines actually dated it 1969, uh, first trade right. printing 1970. So this is a true collector's piece. Lives in protective custody in the office. Um, there, are, there are just some things that um, I, I can't put out. Um, this one uh, was published in 1926, uh, Bootlegger's Map of the United States. Um, this particular cartographer uh, published one other map in the 1940s about uh, food rationing and food ration coupons to kind of poke fun at it. There are a lot of um, puns embedded in here. Um, this 12 mile limit, I think, is like the, the international yeah, uh, limit for, for that. Um, Norse, wets, yeast, <laughs> south, uh, you know, whatever he could, could find um, is included. Uh, this will be adding when we get our 1920s collection put together. This will be um, added to that kind of thing. Um, you know, again, it, it doesn't feel really academic, it's not serious, but you know, this is one person's take on prohibition. Right. And um, it shows up in a lot of books of, that are about pictorial mapping, and so, you know, we kind of need to have it in the collection. The corn built. <laughs> um, you know, like yeah, it's just how how much how much how many things can we we spin? Um, Springfield. Yeah. She, she can or something. <laughs> she kegel. She can. Yeah. Free port. So uh, ninety nine and forty four one hundred is pure. Eventually, why not now? Um, it just you know smugglers bridge. So. I, I, I laugh when I see this sometimes when, when our daughters were little and we, starting in about third or fourth grade, every other summer, it would be the four of us in a car together and we'd go someplace for a month. And one year we drove all the way around uh, Lake huh. Superior. Wow. And there's been this running joke ever since about Canadian bacon smugglers. And I look at this and I think, I think about the Canadian bacon smugglers jokes and every time I see this. Um, so, you know, from that, um, this map is a lot more uh, uncomfortable. Um, we buy the serious stuff. This is a map published by the Association of Southern Women for the Prevention of Lynching. It published in 1930, er, or not published in 1930, published in 1939, uh, showing uh, states that had lynchings in them each year during the decade of the 30s. This is, this is one of those things that's really hard to look at. Um, but we need to have this in the collection. Um, we can't afford to sweep things like this under the rug. And so I have to say I have not come up with the best way or the best context um, to present this to a class. We have a class that comes in on a fairly regular basis called Writing Across Media. And they come in and I set up almost like a, a museum where I'll have 10 or 12 groups of materials. And uh, each one, there will be a paragraph that I've written and then a couple leading questions to get people to where I want mm -hmm. them to be. I would love to put this out but I'm not sure how to do it. Mm. And so um, it just, it's, it's one of these things that I know I have it, um, I will take it out um, as I think it needs to be taken out. Um,
But it's one of those things that I think people need to be warned before they look at it. Uh, because this, this is a really difficult thing uh, for different people in different ways. Um, but still, it's, it's something, you know, we're the University of Illinois and, and we talk about the hard problems and, and this is one of them. Um, this is another one that is kind of odd. Um, this was published in Germany in 1917. Um, the, the meme about the map of empire where the empire is all in red, it's on a cylindrical projection, centered on England, you've got the repeat. Um, there are other memes. Uh, one of them is uh, the, the use of the spider or the octopus mm. to show someone, person, or a country who is inappropriately and aggressively very grasping and controlling. Typically, maps of this period are showing Austria this way, or 20 to 30 years later, Germany this way, the octopus, the spider. Uh, we do have um, propaganda posters in three different, they're exactly the same graphic, three different uh, languages showing Hitler. It's Hitler's head on a spider body. Uh, the thing about this one that's a little bit differently is that the Germans or the Austrians are saying the problem is Great Britain. Mm. And so the, the um, the title uh, translates to Freedom of the Seas. And so we've got this guy who's England. And down at the bottom, all of these different areas and the date that they fell under British control. Now, if you look at this, you'll notice the United States is not listed. That's because we're no longer under British control. But everyone else is. And to make sure that the reader knows exactly who you're talking about, little Union Jack. So this is kind of like the, the bearskin hat uh. and then a Union Jack in the center of it. Make sure that anyone who looks at it knows exactly who is Also, in. if you look from here, it's like the Great Britain flag. It's, it's the flag, yep, yep. So it's, it, you know, when I saw this, you know, I already had Austria or Germany as an octopus. I had to have this because it, sh it uses the meme the other direction. Back, like back at them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, every once in a while I, I kind of luck into something like that. And they, they, they really were everywhere. Like. They were everywhere, yes. Now, so I have this one. I didn't bring another map that came out either at approximately the same time. It's basically the same map. It's a German map, anti-British Empire, but instead of being very uh, emotionally evocative, it's cut and dry data. Hmm. It's, it's the data version of this map. And so we were able to pick that up in the last six months or so. Um, again, I wanted to show the, the situation through the German eyes in as many different ways as possible. Have you? I'm sure you have noticed, but like I, I was, I read about it like uh, some time ago. But all these maps, they disproportionately they show the size of the. That's that's because um, these these are on. I, I'm going to just say on a cylindrical projection. I can't tell you which one, mm -hmm. um, but the thing that works about a cylindrical projection is that your lines of latitude and longitude meet at a, at a right angle. Mm. They were intended for navigation. Um, and they were kind of the default map for a long time. And yes, uh, centered on Western Europe, which means you have incredible distortion. Right. Now, if we were the map library, I would, I, I have a book about projections that we could look at. You showed me the one. I showed you that one, the one with just the, right. the line drawings. And there is something called a TSO indicatrix, which is a regular size circle. And you can apply it to a projection and see, based on that regular size circle, how it changes in size 
or in shape. It's a very clear way of illustrating what the distortion of the landmass is going to be right. based on that projection. The, the thing about uh, projection is you always have to compromise somewhere. Mm. Um, and so it's either in, in an angle, it's in an area, or it's in a distance. And so you, you kind of pick two, and then the third one just goes out the window. Is, it, is, is that a common question people ask you? Getting that distortion <clears throat> You know, I th I I'm not asked about projections and uh, the problem of distortion as often as I should be. Yeah. Uh, you know, GIS makes it so easy to pick a projection without understanding the consequences, and people don't really think about the fact that there are going to be different projections that are more appropriate to use in one situation over another. Hmm. And so, but considering the time period that this was produced and the purpose, I'm not at all surprised. They, they basically took probably a Mercator, but some sort of cylindrical projection, made all the land masses dark, and then drew these beautiful, red octopus tentacles, I can't remember how many, many more than eight, um, on it. it. It's it's quick and dirty map making is so what it is. This is drawing? So no, this is printed. Got it, got it, okay. um, I can actually feel a little bit of a difference in texture. Um, th this is probably some sort of lithography, right. which would have been um, a stone, and it's that was um, drawn on. Uh, and there's a chemical process with hydrophobic um, processes or properties and then where you put the ink and then you put the paper on top of it and you press it down and then voila, you have the map. Um, uh, color lithography printing um, kind of is a mid to kind of third quarter of the 19th century is where it really started going. Uh, prior to that, um, uh, maps would have been engraved in reverse on a copper plate and then printed and then and colored. You know, if, if the printing press was not invented, how do you think the world would have been? Like the, the world of geography, the world of, you know, like we <laughs> see ourselves. Yeah. And as a, you know, like we know where we are mm -hmm. because we know where to, like, you know, like the map. So, like, mm -hmm. maps become really a, an extension of, of us. Right. How do, you think, right. How, how do you think we would think about the world without maps? Well, you, you, you see, you see, well, the earliest maps uh, would not have been able to be made without Traveler's Tales because the cartographers who were creating them didn't go and do the surveying. Right. They weren't on the ships. They weren't on the Silk Road. They were relying on other tales. Um, I, I am, mapping is very ancient. Um, and we are inherently a graphical species. Hmm. Um, we prefer pictures over words. Um, you know, print language is very abstract. Um, this is much more concrete in some ways. I don't think that without being able to spatially, to, to depict space, space in graphics, if we were stuck describing things in words, we would never all be seeing the same image in our heads. Right. And, and, and this is part of the um, whole bit about working with people who want to use maps. You come in and you say, I want. And you might feel like I'm asking you 20 questions, but I'm seeing in my mind a particular set of images that I have seen either here or in some other library. And I'm trying to figure out if the images in my mind are going to at all match how you're describing what you need. 
but it eventually comes to me going to a drawer and saying, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? Because I can't say, well, we have a map by, published by the Central Intelligence Agency of Africa um, in 1982, and it's about this big, and all of the countries are in different pastel colors. And by the way, there are only four colors because you don't need more than four colors. That was actually kind of proved here on campus. Um, that's not good enough. You have to see it. And so, you know, maps, um, there were maps being drawn in ancient Egypt because every year after the Nile flooded, they had to go back out and resurvey. And so, you know, it's, it's this isn't anything new. Um, it took a little while for mapping to catch up with the printed word um, because you can't really do movable type with this. Um, maybe you could up here and down here, but the image itself, mm. it's complete in a whole. Right. And so, um, you, it took a little while for that part to catch up. Uh, but, you know, now um, you can go in, you can scan this, you can erase as many of those pink lines as you want to. If you erase this pink line, you can fill it in with black. You would, with, with digital processes, cartography is completely different. Mm. Um, it's, it's produced differently, but I think that um, people who are producing maps in a digital environment still need to have some working knowledge of what um, reasonable design is and about how people use graphics right. or read graphics. You know, it, it's funny that you, that, you, that you say that, you know, text doesn't really translate into the same image. Mm -hmm. And there's this new technology where you, you write text and these images show up. Oh, I know, I, I know. know. I know my my husband has been watching these YouTube videos where uh, lyrics for a song have been fed into an AI and the AI produces images. Yes. Well, the and, AI and isn't necessarily producing the images I'm seeing. And maps, too. And maps, too. And <laughs> it's kind of like, you know, you've read a book, you've loved a book, and then somebody makes it into a movie. And suddenly, what are you seeing in your head? Are you still seeing the characters in your head the way it you were seeing them? Or is it That's, going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think I this is the last one I brought today. Um, you know, this is this is sweet. Over the summer, he so I told you I live around here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and over the summer he came to visit me, and we started around here. Mm -hmm. We went all the way up, yeah, on a thirty-mile bike ride. Great across the Fox River. Great, <laughs> and you just demonstrated something really important about maps. I was here. This is what it was like. Right. <laughs> you know, they they're they're really a good way of. Um, connecting, um, of starting a conversation, of finding common ground. Um, Geneva, I, the little traveler restaurant and gift shop, went there for years with my mom. Um, and then there was um, uh, right here, see this, I can do this too, actually I think it was right here in Geneva, on the east bank of the river there was a restaurant called the Mill Race Inn. And uh, when my brother and I were little, we could tell our parents what we wanted to do for our birthday. And I guess I was kind of stodgy as a child. I wanted to go to the Mill Race Inn for lunch. And so my birthday's in January. The river was partly iced over. Oh, let me tell you, I will never forget that birthday because that was the birthday where we saw a one-footed duck standing out on the ice. You know, it's dumb stuff like that. But we went to the Mill Race Inn for lunch. It's not there anymore. It's been torn down. Um, I love this map uh, for a number of reasons. Every time I look at this, I think of the trolley car that's going into the land of make-believe on Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, which obviously predates Google Guys. Um, uh, but, but I look at that, and I can actually hear the sound that the trolley made as it went through his wall and into the land of make-believe. Um, on the back, it's a little hard to read what's on the back. That's because um, at some point somebody stabilized this using a very uh, somewhat translucent Japanese paper. Um, 
If we were to do this work now, um, if it had come and hadn't already been treated, uh, what we would do is um, uh, they would put Japanese paper at these tears um, where the folds intersect, but not over the entire piece. And then it would be encapsulated in polyester film, that same stuff that the postcards were in, um, so that we were able to handle it without it falling apart. So it's a little hard to read. Um, it's easier to read, though, than some other things that we had done years ago. Um, the, uh, the thinking now about physical preservation or conservation of library materials or museum objects is that a kind of first do no harm, and secondly, anything you do needs to be completely 100% reversible. Hmm. Uh, we didn't used to subscribe to that. And so I have a lot of maps where um, uh, on this side, there's like some weird plasticky something that's been actually glued, heat glued onto the paper. And on the back side, it's like this really heavy fabric. It, and, and this was an acceptable way of dealing with this kind of material 40, 50 years ago. Um, the problem is they can't undo it. And so I have a lot of roadmaps where I can't read the back because it has this fabric that has been basically ironed onto it. Wow. Um, this one, at least, we can still read it. Um, it I, I presume, I haven't looked at how it's showing up on our digital collection of railroad maps, but I presume that they did a little bit of image enhancement after it was scanned so you could read the text mm -hmm. um, on the screen. But this is kind of one of my favorites because I like to look at I like to look at the pictures. I love the colors. And then, uh, what year was this? This is 1911. 1911. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did a little bit of reading about the Chicago and Fox River Valley. Um, it it was um, uh, not steam driven. It was an electric line. And um, so I, I did a little bit of reading about that and it, it, the phases that it was built in. Um, you know, it was just, it, it was interesting kind of local history. Um, I grew up there. So Naperville is a lot larger now than it was. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean. I, I don't drive in Naperville after said. dark now because all of my landmarks are gone or have changed some magically to the other side <laughs> of the street because they moved the street. You know, uh, something I find interesting about this map is that um, I, I looked at, I mean, I, I told you I live here. Um, it just it just looks different in, in, in the sense of um, like everything is the same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's something about this map that just that looks it It looks, well... Um, like, I, I, I like it. I, I like it. Um, there's, there's something kind of comfortable about it. Yes. And when, when I look at it... Um, it's comfortable in kind of the same way that when you open up older editions or even newer editions of Winnie the Pooh and the flyleaf, the, the, the end papers rather, on the inside are the map of the 100 acre wood. It's comfortable kind of in the Winnie the Pooh comfort level. There's just something welcoming about it. Uh, the funny thing about this though is that sometimes people look at these older maps, and they're astounded. They, they can't figure out where things are because there's so much empty space right. in between the towns. Uh, so especially when people are working with air photos and they're looking at a chronological stack, um, I tell them to look at the photo that's closest to us in time mm. because that's going to be the thing that's closest to what their image is. Right. And then work backwards and slowly strip away the uh -oh. change to get to the earliest. Instead of starting at the earliest and you have to build up right. with, without really a good tether to really make sure that you're in the right place. So that usually works well. So if someone came in and they were interested in using this and they were kind of having that almost spatial dislocation, um, I've got a number of maps of kind of the Chicago metro area that I'd pull out and say, okay, so here we are. Here's, here's Naperville, here's Naperville. 
here's a roar, here's a roar. It was just, you know, you kind of let your fingers do the walking in parallel on right. two different maps or two different images to get to the right place. Have you compared the aerial images from like 1911, for example? So the like earliest photos that we're going to have um, uh, for this area is probably about 1938. Okay. 1938, 1939, and no, I haven't. The the Rye Flyer was 1903, so planes were not a thing yet. <laughs> so, they were, yeah, but, uh, so yeah. the earliest photos that we have in the collection are 1935. I think that there are some photos elsewhere in the state um, that I think were probably flown about 1928, 1929, you know, kind of in there. Um, 35 is as far back as we can go, though. You know, I, I told you I wanted to write this essay about, like, you know, I was going to say Urbana Champagne, but I'm going to say Champagne Urbana. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and this map makes me want to write an essay about mm -hmm. this whole, because it, it, I've lived here for about, you know, six years. Uh huh. And this map just makes me look at everything like so, like so different. It, like. it makes you look at things differently. And so, I I would I would probably you know if you came in and you want to write about this map, I'd pull out um, probably some maps of the area from you know, the 60s, 70s, 80s, right. you know, to the present. But then I think that the other thing that we would need to do is take and take this map and go back even farther. And we do have a couple kind of collected sets, um, unbound atlases of historical maps of Illinois. I'm sure there has to be a map of Indian trails in there. You know, you need to take a look at that. What, what, were, what were the trading paths to come into this area? Um, because a lot of the original your early roads, the ones that go out in that kind of spiky right. pattern, many of them are on those original uh, footpaths. So, right. you know, there would be that. Um, the other thing is, you know, we probably would want to talk about what's going on here you know, with the, um, uh, the displaying and the Illinois Mission Canal and then the, the, the drainage canal or the side canal. Um, you know, it's you know, what's going on here? How, how did building not one but two canals change what was going on up here as well as what's going on down here? Um, the, the other thing, you know, is you, you, you get kind of uh, a sense of uh, urban, but, you know, it's not urban with a lot of details. You know, the, the details really you know, they just fritter out here. Like I'm, it's the color. It's like, the color and the sense of visual busyness. Exactly. Um, and in, so in some, you know, you can kind of get a sense of maybe there's a road. Um, I don't know if that's a real road coming in. Um, you know, it's just like uh, one of these might be um, the plank road. Uh, I don't know. Um, I'm mystified about this cemetery. What's that? I'm mystified about this cemetery. I would need <laughs> to go back and look. Um, my mental map of Naperville does not have a cemetery there, so I'm not certain no, what cemetery that is. There is one, and it's pretty big too, so I think it's the same one you're probably thinking. It's, of. it's south of the river. Oh, you're the right. The Naperville Cemetery is south of the river on Washington. You're directly right, north right, of the hospital. Right. So there's probably houses over. So I don't know what that is. You know, I looked at it a couple <laughs> times and thought, I really need to get back and look at this. Um, because I'm like, I don't know what um, it's it, It's so just funny. Eola is a, so Eola right now, today, it's a, it's a, it's a road. But it, w w was that a town before? There or? was a small town out there that was basically absorbed. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's there are there are some small towns that just they cease to exist, or um, they were by something that was larger that was uh, growing more aggressively. You, know, you have like Plainfield, and you have like Bolingbroke, and all that. Mm -hmm, it's just mm -hmm. too early for that. Yeah. Oh. Let me go here. So you know, it's 
and uh, this is this is one of the kind of um, entertaining maps. You know, it's just. Yeah, 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 I mean, probably one of my favorites too. There's something about it that uh, I can't about quite it. describe, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. such a yeah, yeah, something special yeah. about it. So I, the other thing that's really kind of interesting about this one is kind of a graphic trick, because you have a map, but yet you feel like you have sky. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a, a funny trick of perspective that's being played just because of the color that they've made this area up here as you get towards Wisconsin. It, it almost looks like you're on a plane or something because mm -hmm. here they, the perspective is, is like more mm -hmm. plain. Right. Like it's mm -hmm. flatter. Mm -hmm. And then, then yeah. it's just like 3D. Yeah, it's a little bit of a kind of bird's eye um, view. Um, most typical bird's eye views are um, uh, more detailed. Um, and uh, a true bird's eye view will have a vanishing point, you know, that point of convergence that we all learned about in like elementary school art class. Um, that point with some move. You think there's like, something, is there a point of convergence out there? I don't know. Uh, so yeah. when you put it up like that, is it seem like to be, but on, on the table, on there, the table, there, there, you, you, there, there seemed to be one. Uh -huh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How did they? do this without like planes mm, a lot of walking a like, lot of walking how do you do it accurately i don't, uh, think, I don't think that there is a whole lot of accuracy here yeah. um sorry i forgot that was there um uh for so for the sanborn fire insurance maps which show building footprints uh the sanborn map company employee would actually come out and would pace the length of the building mm and would know that his pace was approximately X number of feet and then do the map, math. Um, uh, you know, there, there were people who were trained as surveyors and they went out with the autolite and, and a table, basically, and they drew. Um, they measured angles. They basically measured all these angles during the day, and then at night, they went back to wherever they're staying, whether it was a you know, somebody's cabin or their tent, and they would draw what they had seen. Um, you know, the um, there's there's a joke about um, the uh, the guys who are on Mount Rushmore. Mm -hmm. um, three surveyors and the other one. <laughs> you know, surveying was a very um, common thing uh, for the educated young gentleman to learn how to do. Um, Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, uh, they all made some money surveying, um, but it was also essential, especially for the money gentleman, to be able to uh, survey because this is how you knew that your property was your property. You know, your property was worth more than your bank account. And so you had to be able to survey your property to make sure that no one had encroached on it. So you know, people would go out, um, all done analog. The other and, and you had someone, you had a, you had a chain uh, with, with basically straight bars, and there was a set length for that bar. And so you would have somebody who would pull the chain and measure. So you, you never went out and surveyed yourself because you had to have that other person with the chain. Um, sometimes um, uh, surveyors, it was generally uh, gentlemen who were um, white. Um, they were the ones who would have been educated. Um, they might have had uh, an assistant who was a Native American or who was um, uh, black. Um, sometimes it was their wives or their daughters who were pulling the chain for them. So it, it, it could be a family affair, um, but it, uh, y you know, all those straight roads out there, they were all surveyed by hand. Yeah, I do, I do remember uh, surveying things. Mm -hmm. uh, like my, my grandpa also had a farm. Uh huh. And I don't know why, but uh, we were just surveying something because mm -hmm. I think the. I don't think the satellite or the imaging thing was available, mm -hmm. or like for mm -hmm. some reason we just didn't cover the thing, mm -hmm. so we had to like survey something. Yeah, no, the whole satellite thing is new. 
Yeah. Yeah. But right. You know, surveying has been done in the same way for millennia. And it's, it's a very painstaking process. Um, but for the United States, it was absolutely necessary that it be done. Um, after uh, the Revolutionary War, which was in some ways followed on fairly quickly by the War of 1812, the United States did not have a huge bank account. And it had all of these soldiers that it had to pay. And it paid them in script that they could then turn in for property. Right. And so... Um, what was the name of the thing? The the script. No, but the, uh, the, the law, I was forgetting. Um, so, um, there, uh, if you uh, take a look in Illinois, there's, Illinois River comes down and it meets the Mississippi in kind of a triangle. All of this area was part of the, they were called bounty lands. And they were set aside to pay soldiers and their families. And um, the, the United States, it was cash poor but land rich. And so there was a lot of this that was going on. Um, in some cases, uh, uh, the uh, soldiers and their families, they never, they never took possession. They basically turned around and sold their land to a speculator. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, they had to, the, the government had to come up with a way of surveying all this land. Um, and so, um, the first public land surveying system that was done was done in the state of Ohio. And if you look at the state of Ohio, there are six or seven different surveying systems that were tried. And then they finally came up with the system that marched all the way across the United States. Um, the other thing that happened is that um, the United States basically gave land away um, to railroads. Mm. Um, the Homestead, I think. It was the, well, this is, like that, this, so, yeah. so there was the Homestead Act, which basically opened up areas for settlers to come in. And, and we say Homestead Act, and quite often, you know, what a lot of us envision is that final rush, that land rush that occurred when Oklahoma was opened up. And people were at the starting line, and boom, away they went. But the United States government also gave railroads parcels of land to encourage them to build. And what the railroads did is they sold those parcels of land to acquire the capital needed to build the railroad line. And so in some western states, you see that checkerboard pattern. Right. That's because of the way the lands were granted to the railroad, to the railroads. It, it happened in more than one place. Um, we have, if you take a look at our scanned maps, the kind of the image on the top is a map of the state of Illinois with some pink lines drawn on it and then uh, some black lines drawn inside kind of parallel. It's an early illustration of areas that were going to be granted to the Illinois Central Railroad so that they could build. Hmm. So it's, you know, uh, the whole surveying, um, absolutely critical for the United States. And it was done the way it was done because it could be done fairly quickly and it could be replicated. Now, if you go back and you take a look at maps that show different kinds of surveying methods, you look at the original 13 states, maybe plus Vermont, maybe the southern part of Maine. Um, they're surveyed using a different system, a uh, system called meets and bounds, where basically you pick your starting point, and that's sometimes the most important thing about surveying, is you pick your starting point, and then you say, okay, I'm gonna measure from here to that tree, from that tree to that stone. And you measure all the different sides of your regular or irregular polygon, ending up back right. at the original spot. So the original 13 states were measured that way. Um, I think Kentucky and Tennessee are probably meets and bounds states. Um, I don't remember about Alabama or Mississippi. But basically, from Ohio west, 
this public land survey system with that square mile thing going on. Now, there were areas that the United States um, uh, gained control of, gained control, uh, political control of, which had been previously surveyed by the French or the Spanish. What happened is that in those cases, the square United States system just was fit in around the areas that had already been surveyed. They let the previous surveys stand. So if you were to um, take a look at maps along the Mississippi River, in particular in Louisiana, but in some areas going farther north, you'll see that instead of squares, there are these long, skinny parcels that come out perpendicular to the river. This is called long lots, and it's a French method of surveying, and that way, a parcel owner would have a variety of different kinds of land type that he could do different agricultural things with. Plus, he had access to the main transportation route, which was the river. Okay. And so in the very front, the closest, you know, river, and maybe rice paddy. And then f up the hill a little bit, some other crop, cotton, corn, up the hill a little bit more, the house, pasture, up a little bit more, the woodlock where you let your pigs roam free. You know, so it, it, it was made for some level of self-sufficiency to have that kind of long lot. Um, the Spanish had a completely different system uh, based around the Presidio, which uh, created a more square uh, with large tracts of rancheros. So, but those were kind of let be unless for some reason those large tracts of land were being split up. So you got to know some history. Um, the the thing that I also find interesting about how you like your maps and everything mm -hmm. is that you know a, a map is just the the starting point of letting your curiosity just go deep yeah. into mm -hmm. a lot of the history, a lot of the technology, mm -hmm. a lot yeah. of the context that you need in mm -hmm. order to make sense of something yeah. like this. Yeah. Like this. Well, I think that there was a long time ago a book called Have Map Will Travel. <laughs> um, uh, I, I have to say that I'm kind of Have Map Will Talk. Um, it, it's really funny. Um, I, I find that um, when I'm teaching a class, um, there are some things that you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had to do a, uh, an instruction session, part of an instruction session, about special collections libraries for the graduate students who staff the reference desk in the main library. That's highly scripted because I have very particular things I want to say about the map library, its services, some of its policies, how to work with maps in the online catalog. But for other classes, this is up in a PowerPoint or it's out on the table and this is what happens. Um, I, sometimes I feel like you wind me up and let me go, and it is like, have Matt will talk. Um, I had someone pay me a compliment. I don't think she, in, was it, I don't know if she intended it to be a compliment, but I, I had to take it as a compliment. I had uh, presented at a conference, and Afterwards, she came up to me, and she's, she's someone who, who has been you know, in the business of cartography for, for a number of decades, um, not as a librarian, but as a, a production cartographer right. and researcher. And she walked up to me after this paper, and she said, you know what? She said, I'd really like to put Jenny Johnson into a room with a couple of maps for 30 minutes and then see what she tells me about them afterwards. You know, and, and this is really sometimes what it's about. Um, uh, sometimes I feel as if I'm trying to weave whole cloth out of bits and pieces. Right. Um, but, and other times, you know, it's, it, 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 it's very easy. Um, uh, there have been some times when I've given someone an answer and then I say, you know, I'm just making this up. But the answer seems logical to them. So and they're as, willing as to as let as it go. As, so. as, as long as it's interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, give me a map and I'll tell you a story. Um, I, I think that's part of the charm of all of it. Is it like having the map, which is knowing a lot of technology and everything, how they work. Mm -hmm. Also learning the history, learning all the context, but also 
which are also really good at is being able to tell really good stories, which yeah. you know you can you can Thank be you. like you can be really like you know everything, but if you don't know how or to, or I make it up. <laughs> right, right. But, but I and I can tell you what I've made up with such confidence that you won't know I've made it up. And that's fine. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I think that's fine. Like, as long as I'm as I'm entertained and as I'm, uh, as you make me curious, uh -huh. make it up all you want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's just we're. We're incredibly fortunate to have the collection that we have. Um, I, my predecessor uh, was a most excellent map librarian. As I said, he was a great scrounger. Uh, we wouldn't have some of the materials that we have today uh, without him. Um, it's just uh, the, the map library, you know, yes, got its start out of things that were already in the university library. Uh, but at the end of the Second World War, the United States had a lot of surplus maps, uh, both that it had published and that it had captured, and they were distributed to university and college libraries. Um, in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, um, the Library of Congress started to divest itself, the Geography and Map Division started to divest itself of the duplicate copies it had received as Sanborn Fire Insurance maps. Uh, when you registered for copyright, you had to deposit two copies of your publication. And that included two copies of maps if you were registering maps for copyright. And so we got their duplicate copies of the Sanborn Fire Insurance maps. Uh, an absolutely amazing gift. Um, and I'm so glad that technology is transforming how mm. we provide access to these materials because I can point someone to our scanned map of Hinsdale and say, okay, we've got scanned maps of Hinsdale, this, 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 this year. Here's how you get to them. You can download them for free. Right. You can put them in a publication. We appreciate the courtesy of a citation. You it's absolutely astounding. You know, we're a land grant institution, and this is what we should be doing. We're, we're basically giving this stuff away. And I think it's really important to be able to do that. Um, and so we will keep uh, scanning and um, making as much available as we're able. Um, you know, there's always a bottleneck in the throughput. Um, I can only get as so many titles prepped at one time. Um, and the scanning operation can only handle a certain amount of volume right. in any given period. Um, our beautiful Andersonville map, which is larger than 48 by 36 inches, um, they aren't quite able to handle yet. So you, they, they're upgrading their equipment, um, they're getting new cameras, uh, but still it's just because of the size of the piece, it's bigger than this table. Um, they aren't able to quite yet comfortably accommodate it. They probably could, but they're not willing to take the chance of harming uh, right. the piece. Right. And so, you know, I, uh, they're just, I, they're, you know, I'm like, I just won't push. Um, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see, you know, what the next iteration of their space is, what other camera options they have to offer. And, you know, at that point, we'll get the really big stuff scanned. Right. Uh, you know, with maps, you've seen that change mm -hmm. is the only constant. They're, they're always mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. And that will be true also with your life. You, you, yeah. they, they, they will, you're not going to be always the head my no. librarian. No. So what do you hope your legacy will be? What, what do you hope that the next, oh. the person that comes yeah. after, yeah. You, after you, after me, learns? Like, what do you wish you tell them? Well, I think like the president of the United States, I'm going to write them a letter and leave it in the resolute desk. You know, this is this is a tradition. When one president leaves, they always write a personal letter to who, whoever follows them. I, I think I may very well do that. Um, I, my legacy, um, I was talking with Eric, my assistant today, and we were kind of talking about kind of how things were going. And 
I, I said to him, you know, for a while I felt that the only reason that people hired me to run the three map libraries I've run is because I know how to clean house. I, I, things will be in, I say this and it makes it sound like, like my predecessor did not do a good job. He did a really good job. But things will be even better when I leave. Um, I talked about the 180,000 air photos for the state of Illinois. When I came here in 1997, we did not have a list of all the air photos we owned. We now have Excel spreadsheets that list every single photo. And not only do we have a list, but we go through periodically and we make sure that the photos are still in the drawer, that they're in the right place. Um, you know, we're, we're taking care of our cataloging backlog. Uh, when, when I came here, you know, I'd see things in the drawer and they had call numbers and then I could never find them in the online catalog. It was like they were masquerading as if they had been cataloged because they had call numbers on them. Hopefully, well, I don't think we'll get it done, but, you know, we'll be closer to being truly, completely cataloged with things in the online catalog. Um, something that I'm going to need cooperation from others in the library is right now we're scanning all these things and they're living in this universe called the digital library. And if you were to find this piece in our online catalog, there is no indication in the online catalog that it's already been scanned. We need to get that digital library database synced up with the way that data is being shown in our online catalog. Uh, this is this is just this is really critical. Um, it's critical for doing reference work with people, especially distance. But it's also critical so that we don't send the same piece down the hall to be scanned more than once. Um, I am going through and trying to notate in records in kind of a hidden spot because that seems to be the only place that we've scanned something. Scanned and then the month and the year. Um, but I don't always remember. Right. Uh, so I've got a really great student who, um, in the spring, she's going to be coming up behind me and taking care of making sure that I go. actually got that done. But the critical thing would be, you find this in the online catalog, and in the bottom, there's a link that takes you to the image. Right. I think that that's, that's something that's really important. Um, we have, in the 25 years that I've been here, we have migrated three times to new library systems. And each time the data gets dirtier and dirtier. Um, we have some cleanup of, the, of data that I'd really like to get done. I'm hoping we can get the bulk of it done in the first half of next year, and then we'll be done with that. Um, I have some writing and publication projects that some I think I could get done before I retired. One, I was talking with the, the person who was the chair of my committee at the University of Washington, and I talked with him a number of months ago, and I said, okay, so here's the, here's the list. And I said, I said, this thing, there was one thing in particular I said, I think that this is the retirement passion project. Uh, because when I first envisioned it, it was very constrained. And as I worked on it, I realized that it was a lot bigger. Um, and see, my problem, as my mom used to say, is I have kind of a nine-week attention span. And so you know, I, I, I've stood up a number of things at conferences, and I've never turned around and gotten them written. I need to do that writing. Um, We'll see if I get a day of writing squeezed in over winter break. It's, it's, it's part of my job. You know, the research and publication is part of my job as a University of Illinois faculty member. Um, I haven't been doing it for a long time because the map library needed more of my attention. Right. So um, there's that. Um, it, it's kind of funny that you should ask about retirement because um, for a long time, I kind of thought I was going to be, you know, the die with her boots on type librarian. You know, they were going to have to carry me out of the library. Right. I, and other things have happened in my life 
that have kind of tempered that a little bit. Um, and so um, my husband and I would like to travel. Um, I'd like to write. Uh, a number of years ago, I. I took a sabbatical and at the end of sabbatical I thought I wonder if this is what retirement might be like because I could write when I was ready to write mm. and I could step back and do other things when the writing wasn't going well and I thought maybe this is what retirement would be like I, I'll, I'll finally get the writing done because I'm not limited to one day a week and every Wednesday or whatever it is I had to sit down and ramp up and try to remember where I had been the previous week that kind of writing is really hard to do. Um, and I cannot figure out how to write every single day um, because so much of what I do is driven by who comes into the library, what our new materials are, uh, requests being made of me by other people elsewhere in the university library, um, occasionally other professional responsibilities, and so writing regularly takes a back seat, um, which is a shame because I really like to write. Uh, and and there, there have been days when it has gone really, really well. And I'm like, wow, I wrote five, six, seven pages in a day. Yeah, this, this is me. I can do it, um, but it's making it a priority. So in my dream retirement, I'm writing, I'm traveling, I'm not thinking about the map library. Um, it will be hard. We'll see. We'll see. Um, I'm playing the cello. Uh, the, so I've had two sabbaticals. Um, the first sabbatical is when our daughters were in fourth grade. And yes, there were the official sabbatical research and publication production goals. The unwritten sabbatical goal was I was going to begin to play the cello again. I hadn't played for the eight years I had been in Seattle, plus a number of other years. It was almost 20 years I didn't play. Um, I feel more like myself now than I did during that time period when I wasn't playing. You know, the, the music is, is really important. Um, I have started to learn how to play a different instrument. It's called a mandola. Um, it's kind of like the viola counterpart to the mandolin. Um, uh, just I, I borrowed a mandola from someone last March or April, but didn't really get going on it until this fall. I'm taking lessons as an adult. It's really interesting being an adult beginner student. Um, sometimes my teacher and I talk more than we play, and then he feels really badly that we haven't played, but sometimes the talking is as important as the playing. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at it as I need to start this now before I'm presented with the blank slate of retirement. Uh, I need to have some things underway so I can say, yes, in retirement, I'm going to do this. Mm. Um, it's... Uh, I would really like to be able to travel in shoulder season, spring, fall, rather doing it all during the summer. Right. Um, right now, I don't really feel like I can you know, travel for pleasure in September because hey, class has just started. Um, I go to a professional conference every year, kind of the second or third week of October. I'm gone the better part of a week, and that's it for my fall travel except if I decide to go someplace for Thanksgiving. Um, but, I, you know, we're like, gee, we could, we could go to national parks. There are some really great state parks that we could go to that if we went in September or October, we would have it all to ourselves. <laughs> um, and so I'm like, yeah, I, I'd really like to do that. Um, or, so, or Geneva. <laughs> or Geneva, go up to Geneva. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that's missing on here, of course, is Fermi Lab, yeah. and and the big ring. Um, yeah, I'm yet. not certain. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. It, yeah. You know, I I would I would need to I would need to go and look. Yes, yeah, right um, here. I don't know if I don't think they still have bison there, do they? They used to. No, have, they do. They do, do they do. still have yeah. the bison? Yeah. It's been so long since I've been up there. Um, yeah, I I remember being you know fairly young, and my mom and dad would 
drive through Fermi Lab on our way to Geneva so we could look at the bison. So that, that was kind of fun. <laughs> so, um, you know, retirement's it's in the cards. Uh, I'm not ready to officially announce a day or a date. I've kind of figured out what it's going to be. Um, but you know, things change. Um, it's just, I don't know. It's, um, I can't imagine. It, it's funny, there have been a couple map libraries jobs posted <laughs> recently, and I've looked at them and thought, nah. I'm going to retire from the University of Illinois. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I've looked, you know, I, not seriously. Um, but, you know, whenever something's posted, I always read it to see what people are looking for. And uh, there are some app library jobs I'm not qualified for um, because I haven't spent a lot of time in the digital world. Uh, I'm fortunate, I'm, I'm very fortunate here. I haven't had to do this, which is basically the 19th century format and learn in depth a whole new set of late 20th, early 21st century skills called GIS. I can talk GIS theory, but it's been a long time since I've had to push the buttons. Right. Uh, we're fortunate we do have a GIS specialist in the university library. He's, he's in our scholarly commons. He's really, really good. Um, I'm really glad we have him because it means I don't need to devote uh, time and energy to keeping those skills up. Um, I, I'm really glad that my husband's a computer guy <laughs> because um, it's given me an out. I haven't, I haven't had to spend a lot of time dealing with technology and figuring out how to solve that problem. I just say, Tom, help! And, and he takes care of it for me. It's, it's a real luxury. Um, but, you know, it's, it's good in a way because I have real problem remembering sequences of steps when I'm doing something on a screen that doesn't have a real gross motor action associated with it. You know, you know, open this, click on this, do this. I can't remember the sequence of steps. But if you were telling me how to do something where there was a physical activity, mm -hmm. I'm going to be able to remember the sequence of steps easier. But those small, small gestures that you make with a keyboard or a mouse, no. Um, the other thing that I've noticed is kind of interesting is if I know I need to remember something and I'm reading it on the computer screen, I print it out. Mm -hmm because I know that my memory is so spatial that I will have a better chance of remembering something because part of the memory mechanism is where was it on the page. Right. And there is no page mm. when you're looking at a screen. And so I'll, I'll, read, I'll read fiction happily, phone, Kindle, Nook, whatever. But if it's professional paper, something I need to remember, a report, it's usually printed. Um, I don't know if it's something about my age, um, something about my, my, my mental makeup, um, but if I read it on the screen, I need to read it, and then I'll go away and I'm like, well, what was that? And I'll have to go and read it again. <laughs> right. I, printing it, I just need to read it once, and it's it's pretty well up here. Are you are you worried about the future of libraries? Um, I so something. I don't know how to answer that. Uh, no, not necessarily. I I think that depending on what kind of library it is, in you know, public library. You, it, its role may change. Um, academic library, like the library here, we're already seeing this. Um, we're all buying the same core set of literature, whether it's books or journals. The things that are going to set us apart 
are the things like what we've got on the table, or the things that are in the map library, sister libraries, the rare book and manuscript library, the Illinois History and Lincoln Collection, the um, university archives. Those are the things that are going to uh, make the University of Illinois Library unique right. more right. than anything else. So I, I think that there will always be a place. And also, we're never going to be able to digitize everything. Uh, people do come in and they just say, well, why, why haven't you digitized all of this? Mm -hmm. Well, money translates into anything. Money is people, money is time, money is equipment, money is server space. You know, it, it all boils down to money. And then on top of that, yes, graphic materials are copyrighted. And a lot of people don't realize that. They presume that only words, right. only text, only prose is copyrighted. They don't realize that graphics are too. And so um, I'm, you know, people say, so when are you going to scan it all? And I'm like, oh, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. You know, and, and I usually talk either about, you know, the, the, the problem of just not enough resources or also copyright. You know, in the United States, um, uh, maps published by the United States federal government are in the public domain. No problem. But maps published by individual states, maps published by county or local governments, they may or may not be. And then you go to some other country, all you have to do is go across the border to Canada and it all changes because those topographic maps, the, the topographic maps produced by the British Ordnance Survey, they're copyrighted. And so you, the, the United States gives a lot of stuff away that other countries don't. And so you, you just had to be cognizant of that. Um, and just there are just some things we're never going to be able to skim. Anything else? Wonderful. <laughs> so what have I, I've talked so far nonstop for two and a half hours. We could keep going. You know, this is <laughs> <laughs> sometimes um, Eric, my assistant, and David, our Matt catalogger, a, a class will come in and they can hear me kind of just and then I come back and I'm like <sighs> and then I look and see how long I was talking and then they laugh and I say, oh my gosh, I just talked for an hour without stopping. I'm like, this is what you do. So it's, I mean, you, 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 love, you, you love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't even feel like yeah, that level of um, of passion and, mm -hmm. and curiosity is contagious. So I hope so. I hope so. Um, and you know, I've I've been really fortunate. I know I talked about you know the university library as a whole. Um, I have been so fortunate in the staff that I've had in the map library. Um, uh, they've um, they've come in and. Um, they, they, you know, when I've said I need to go and do something, they're like, you go do, you take care of what you need to do. Um, they, um, <coughs> excuse me, they've never questioned when I've said I'm staying home to write. Um, they've, they've brought their own creative intelligence um, to bear on problems that we have. Um, you know, we're really small. It's, it's me and two others and, you know, six undergraduate student employees. And um, it's because we're small, um, if someone needs something, um, I will do what I need to make sure they have it, whether it's uh, vacation at a particular time or time to get a kid to a doctor or, or um, to be a parent in the stands for a basketball game. You know, it's just because we're small, we can be flexible mm. and accommodate what, what each other need. Um, I really think that what uh, David and Eric do as parents um, in some days is more important than what they're doing as an employee of the University Library. 
and um, I make sure that they know that, you know, their family, their kids, their own personal life, you know, yes, it can take priority. Right. Um, and we just make sure it happens. Um, I'm really fortunate, you know, that I've had people who uh, were willing and able to work that way and who were able to extend to me the same kind of support that I extended to them when, when something was going on. Because um, we all have things that come in with us. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't leave the rest of your life behind when you walk through the door. Right. And so, you know, we've been very fortunate. Um, we, the MAP library sustained an incredible loss uh, last year in the fall um, when my assistant Jim Cotter, who had been in the MAP library with me for 14 years, suddenly died. Um, that was really tough. Uh, I think that if last fall you had asked me to come and spend time with you, I would have turned you down. Um, because I wasn't able to take on anything else. Um, Eric started working with us in February and um, we become reinvigorated. And, and so, you know, that's, it, it's just really, it's kind of interesting how much having an individual or the loss of an individual and a new person stepping in kind of changes um, how a place feels. Um, Jim, um, and this is going to sound funny, Jim was my, my window into the world of Illini sports. Um, he covered uh, football and basketball for a local paper, not here, but I think in Danville. Um, he did a, a, a blog or a podcast. Um, I always knew that on Monday if I came in and said, now can you explain? You know, he would always be able to explain to me. He was just, uh, but you know, he wasn't just about University of Illinois sports. He, he, covered, he covered high school sports. He loved high school sports. Um, and it was a big loss. Uh, I couldn't even tell you who we played this past weekend because I no longer have that connection. Um, but you know, Eric came in and uh, now we talk about things like Cub Scouts and going out and you know, doing, doing things you know, with, with his son and his brother and his brother's sons. And it's, it's a completely different kind of family conversation, which is kind of fun since we didn't have girls. Or we didn't have boys, we just had the two girls. And yeah, I have a brother, but yeah, brothers. Um, you know, it's just, so you know, you know, so if Eric needs time to do something with his son or something with his dad, I'll make sure that, you know, it happens. Um, David, he has a daughter and two sons. Um, if they need something, it's the same thing. We will make sure it happens because um, if, if I don't help them take care of their family, who's going to? And so, um, you know, I'm really thankful for that. Uh, last um, fall, I had um, um, some very caring support from some members of library administration uh, when I was just like, we can't, we can't be open over fall break. Um, we don't have anyone who has the knowledge base to be able to serve any library patrons who would come in. And I already have plane tickets to go to Portland for the holiday. Uh, we need to be closed. There was no question. Yes, go ahead and do it. Please make sure to post your closed hour, the fact that you're closed here, here, here. Have a good holiday. You know, very um, humane, uh, very caring. Um, and it's kind of what, you know, we had experienced at other times when, you know, we needed help as a family or, you know, sometimes as a daughter. Um, you know, you, you take care of your family and then you come back and you take care of the library. Um, so I don't think that the library has suffered for that. 
uh, because it means that we can focus on the work of the library knowing that we have the flexibility to take care of other things. So we don't have to worry in the back of our heads about what's happening elsewhere. So um, my mom always said I saw the University of Illinois through rose-colored glasses. <laughs> in some ways I still do. It's just I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, the collection is amazing. Um, the people who come in to use it, um, interesting. We had Geology 411 in today, and oh, these people were happy to be looking at maps. You know, it's just, they were excited about looking for a map to do a project about. Um, some of them, they got a little frustrated because they couldn't find the map. Uh, one of them laughed when I said, oh, you haven't found the one that sings to you yet. <laughs> but she understood, you know, that they're just, you know, and they had been encouraged to find a place they were interested in, that they knew, that they had wanted to travel to, that they had already been to. And she just wasn't finding anything that spoke to her. But I understood why the TA was saying, find something that you're interested in. Because this is a project that they have to do over the next four weeks. Mm. They're going to be living with this map. Um, some of them just walked in and said, here it is. Others took more time, but they didn't get frustrated. They, they, were, they seemed happy to be looking and finding out what the possibilities were. So, so that's always fun. Um, we had, uh, then after Geology 411 came and went twice today, um, late this afternoon, we had uh, a pair of library friends come through. Um, they are supporters of conservation preservation. So I pulled out a number of pieces that I either needed to send to have some sort of physical stabilization done or that conservation preservation had worked a miracle on. And so we looked at half a dozen things. Um, the, the lady actually had gone to the library school. She was a library school graduate when the library school was still on the third and fourth floor of the main library building. So we had an interesting conversation about where the library school office had been and where the library school, there, there had been a library science library where that had been and where faculty offices were. And then on their way out of the building, uh, the person from library advancement was going to take them to the second floor past the bronze plaque of Catherine Lucinda Sharp who was the founder of the library school. Um, her bronze used to be on the third floor low enough that you could rub her nose for good luck. She's been hung a bit higher again, but um, uh, the lady wanted to pay a visit to Miss Sharp before she left the building, which was kind of sweet. Um, I, don't, I don't know when she graduated, uh, but it was probably pre-1975, you know, based on what my understanding is of where the library, map library was mm. physically and when we expanded to the other side of the hall where the library school faculty offices, some of there had not been. So um, it, that, that was kind of fun. But you know, it, I was like, okay, so I didn't really know what to show them um, until I realized that you know, the hook would be, I can talk about the great things that conservation preservation does. And then I was looking, and I realized I never send them any books, except for, you know, the little atlas that needed its own cover. Um, I send them all this flat paper stuff. And we do have a person in preservation conservation who specializes in working with flat paper. Mm -hmm. So um, preservation conservation, it's amazing how it's grown in the last 25 years. It used to be one little room in the basement of the main library and very rudimentary things were done. Um, and now there's this beautiful lab um, and they can, um, they can soak things to, to wash them and they can remove glue and they can, you know, line things and do encapsulation and it's all done right there. Um, it's the only the really tricky or the very, very large things that need to be sent off campus. You know, institutions like the University of Illinois, it's, it's a big places and, mm -hmm. and whatever. 
but I think people like you is the, what really make places like this, you know, really special people like you that hope so. have lived, um, you know, you, you live a life of having the courage to follow what you want. So mm -hmm. since college, you decided to, you know, I'm going to finish biology and I'm going to start <laughs> this <laughs> geography because of this class. Uh -huh. And I don't know how it's going to lead, but I'm going to yep. do it. Uh, the story that you told me with your husband, like these little things of following what you want to follow mm -hmm. in your heart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those two years of biology and chemistry have been very useful sometimes. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what advice do you have for young people, either in high school or in college, about how to live a life of, of passion, how to, oh. how to really follow what they want? And, yeah. And, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, take advantage of opportunities. Um, remember that if you say no, that's as much choice as saying yes. Mm. Um, do I sound like a mom? Um, <laughs> uh, this was uh, something really hard for me to learn. Uh, don't be afraid to let someone know that you don't know. Um, and then be willing to explore uh, what you find out when you say, I don't know about this. Um, I uh, I take chances. Um, remember that not everything needs to be serious. You, you can have a professional passion um, and you can have a good time with it. Right. Um, it, 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 yes, it's serious. I guess you could say it's serious fun. Um, I, you it's, know, I, it's seriously fun. It, it can be seriously fun <laughs> or it can be funnily serious. Mm, I don't think it works the other way. Um, but I think most of all is um, don't be afraid to take a chance and see where something leads. Uh, you know, yeah, you're going to stumble. Um, uh, learn what you can from something that doesn't work out. Um, you know, sometimes you don't know whether you're going to like something until you've actually tried it. Uh, it's just, um, you know, I've got regrets. Um, I'm wishing that I had taken German and Russian. Um, I'm wishing that I had taken a class about government documents in library school. But at this point, that knowledge would be so old. Mm. You know, that was a regret that I had maybe 30 years ago. Um, at this point, you know, it would be so old that, you know, it's too late. But I really regret not having taken other languages. I took two years of French in high school, enough to get me into the university four semesters of Latin here, and then two more semesters of Spanish here. That was dumb. You know, I'm all in one language group. Uh, you know, German would have been really helpful. Um, Russian, yeah, exactly. Um, I'm really good with a dictionary. Um, Russian, um, uh, I have to get kind of in the mode, and then I'm, I transliterate character by character, and then it's like, oh, that kind of looks like a word I know. You know, it's just like I'm, and, and the only reason I say this is I've worked with a lot of Russian materials. Um, uh, I, it, and it's one of those cases where I'm, I'm fortunate. I can go to someone, a, a Slavic language specialist in the university library, and say, I've got this map. Please check it. And so, you know, you know, you know, be passionate but willing to reach out for help. Um, it's uh, a lot about making connections. Um, make those connections. Um, I don't know. Uh, I've been so happy doing what I've been doing, though. Which, I don't know. I'm, some days I feel like I'm the only one in the world who who has been this lucky. Um, and then I tell people about, you know, what happened here in the early, mid-1980s, and then I always say, but it was a different world. 
And so um, opportunities are going to be presented differently now than they were presented for me. And um, it might be difficult to identify those opportunities. Um, and some days you maybe just want to say, I'm going to rest here for a while. And that's OK, too, to say, I'm happy here now. I don't need to keep looking for the next thing. I don't need to keep looking around the corner. I'm happy here now. Um, it's OK to think about your life as, as a series of plateaus. This is also how I think about technology. You, you, you're here. You adopt a technology. You aren't continually upgrading your software nonstop. You pick your level, and you stay there until you need to change. And then you move to a different plateau. And sometimes I think that life is that way, too, that you pick where you want to be for a while until there is an obvious reason to change. And you, uh, my husband and I, we were very happy in Seattle. We could have stayed there longer. But it was time. It was time for us to move. Um, I had this opportunity. Uh, it was, and, and we took advantage of it. And so you pick your place, stay there. Um, do a good job of positioning yourself, getting yourself ready for the next possibility. You, I, I could not have moved from Clark University to the University of Illinois. I needed to be at an intermediary, large institution. The, the University of Washington is not a land-grant institution. Um, the land-grant institution of the state of Washington is Washington State University. The University of Washington is a C-grant university, but it's basically the same thing. I had to be at a big institution like that in order to come back here. And I knew that. And so, you know, that's why after being at Clark for a year and a half, not quite two years, I started looking because I knew that someday I would have the opportunity to apply for a job here. But I needed to get myself ready. Clark was great, but it wasn't big enough. Mm. And so, you know, you, you look, um, you think about what that gene, dream position might be. You read those ads. And then you think, OK, how would my application look right now? What do I need to do so that I hit not only every single requirement, but every single thing that they also have in the preferred area? And you kind of work that way while you're sitting here in a place that you're happy. Because if you aren't taking advantage of that time, you've kind of wasted that time and wasted the opportunity to do maybe something else that you would have liked even more. My mother used to number her lectures. I don't. <laughs> but you just got, it's a mom lecture. It, that's really what it is. That's good. I mean, it, it, it always, <laughs> always, it's always good to learn from other people's mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, I, you know, other regrets. I regret that I never finished um, the PhD at the University of Washington. But you know, it was it it was a, an impossibility. Um, coming here, um, stepping into a library that had not had a permanent head for five years, and then suddenly. Slightly less than a year after starting a new position, having a very young family. Uh, there's no way I could have gone back to school. Um, I played, toyed with the idea at some point. Um, I actually emailed some office someplace, registrar or something like that, to find out if they still had my transcripts, to ask some questions about um, transferring credits, um, it's, it's, you ask questions about, well, I already have a, uh, a BA. If I wanted to come back and do a BA in a different topic, would I need to take language again and all that? You know, I, I toyed with it, um, but it just didn't seem 
to be the right time, a good use of my energy. How about um, right now? You, sh you still have time. I, uh, in 2019, um, fall of 2019, um, I was thinking about going back to school and uh, doing um, some sort of degree through the School of Music. And I was thinking, okay, now typically, you know, if, if you're going to be some sort of music performance major, quite often you're on that path by the end of your freshman year or start of your sophomore year of high school. And you basically have three years to prepare, you know, or two years to prepare. And so I thought, okay, if I kind of played with the calendar, you know, I thought, okay, I start to practice here. And at this point, I'm going to find somebody to coach me. I need someone besides me to hear how I'm playing. I need some outside input. And I was really happy with how I was playing. And then COVID. Hmm. Yeah. And I, uh, we shut down in March. Let me tell you, that was an experience. Um, and I kind of kept up the momentum on the practicing and, you know, being critical about how I was playing. March, April, May, and then June hit. And I realized I had no reason to practice because everything that I would have done that summer had been canceled. That was kind of the end of it. Um, the, the COVID shutdown was interesting. Um, I had made plans to go to Miami for uh, my, the, the annual Miami Met Fair, which is held at like the Miami Historical Society. It's, it's a big thing. And of course, it got canceled. Well, this was a problem because the university would have reimbursed me for my unused plane ticket. But um, my husband was going to fly down with me and our daughters were going to fly down and meet us in Miami for spring break. So we went anyway. Um, you went anyway? <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. Now, family I grew up in was pretty straight-laced. I never did anything for spring break except go home. Well, let me tell you, I made sure I got everything that I should <laughs> not have done on a spring day break done in the same day. Um, I won't tell you about the rest of that day, except it involved uh, a man of war and a really bad sunburn and some other stuff. So our daughters arrived and my husband and I just, we just were totally wiped out, but it was good. They, they got down, we rented a car, we went down to Key West and watching on TV what was going on with closures and uh, the whole health industry and government. I felt as if we were watching a zombie movie. It didn't seem real. Mm. And then all the bars on Key West were closed on St. Patrick's Day at noon and Key West emptied out. We had Key West practice. So here I am really badly sunburned and watching all of Zombieville going on on the TV. And I said to my husband, I don't want to get on a plane. I don't want to have to sit in the Miami airport with all these people that I don't know and then got on a plane with the sunburn, you know, on and on and on. We kept our rental car. I canceled our flights and we kept our rental car and we drove back to Champaign from Key West in two days. Um, we stayed in the Atlanta area the, the one night we were on the road. We pulled into Hampton Inn and it was the manager at the desk. And first of all, he told us that we had gotten his next to last room that was available that night. And then he indicated we were kind of behind the curve because all the previous week he had nothing but Canadians. 
trying to leave the United States. They were leaving Florida and they were heading north to get across the international border before it was closed. I was like, is this like end of the world times? You know, it really yeah. felt like that. It was. You should have stayed in Key West and just enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> for, for a whole, for a whole, yeah, whole spring. Yeah, you know, um, I could have because I had my laptop. I probably could have worked from there, but um, you know, my husband couldn't have, and I don't think that our daughters were equipped to, you know, pivot to doing online whatever happened for the second half of the semester. Uh, it was like, wow. Um, I hope to never experience anything like that again. The sunburn or the, the, the COVID thing is just like, um, I don't know, we, it, it, the whole Key West trip scene it still seems like a bad dream. It was just, um, it, it's like the world was falling apart and we're in paradise. If it happens again, just make sure to have a lot of cash so you can buy a house. That's for, right. That's for, right. For, for cheap because you yeah. know, people may be leaving. Yeah. Good deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, that, is, that, was, that was kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, of course, we could never figure out how to use those unused airline tickets. So American got a lot of money from us because, mm. you know, the, the, the tickets expired, but we weren't really ready to get on a plane yet. So... So, uh, and I, so you laughed earlier, you, you said something about writing something about, and then you corrected yourself and said Champaign-Urbana. I, I got a chuckle out of that, you know, earlier this right. evening. Yeah. So, you know, we're the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Right. But officially the metropolitan area is Champaign-Urbana. Right. And uh, a lot of people don't know that. So it, it's one of those Map Library trivia things. Um, but I actually looked it up. <laughs> okay, good. My good friends at Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> uh, librarians won't tell you how much we rely on Google and Wikipedia. <laughs> Even though you have these. Yes, yes. There are some things that, you know, uh, quick trivia or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'll, I'll go to kind of a, um, I'll go to Google or something like that and I'll just put in the most simple search to describe what I'm looking for because sometimes I'm not certain that the terms I'm using to describe something are what other people use. And so kind of in the quest of vocabulary, um, sometimes I'll start with Google just to see what I can find. Um, there are a lot of interesting things out there. Anything else that you want to talk about? Um, to, to end our show, we have a section called Underrated or Overrated. Oh, okay. Where we <laughs> give you a prompt and you okay. tell Great. us what you think. Okay. Um, first one, the alma mater. Oh, I love her. Or are you talking about the song? No, the, the statue. The statue. <laughs> um, uh, oh, she's, she's definitely, uh, she's, I, I think she's probably underrated. Really? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like I, it used to be behind Fallinger before. Oh yeah. And then they moved it. So. Then they moved it, and then it was green for a long time. Um, she, she, I don't, have you been long here, long here long enough to remember when she wasn't there? No. So she's always been there for you. Um, so yes, originally the alma mater was behind Fallinger Auditorium right. before it was Fallinger. And uh, before, then... It, what was it before? The auditorium. Oh. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Someone bought it or something? Or uh, Someone donated? So, so uh, you can, if you give the university a Money. gift of substantial size, you can have a building named after you. Um, the, the Follingers have been very generous to the university. Um, and so, yes, she was behind there, and she was basically at ground level. Uh, and then she was moved out to the corner of Green and Wright on the pedestal. And she turned kind of, if this was a little bit greener, right. she kind of turned this color palette. It was bronze, right? Bronze or copper, That's, yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And she, that, that, yeah. So um, they took it apart. Really? Mm-hmm. 
they took it apart and took it off of the pedestal, and I think it went upstairs to sh uh, upstairs upstate uh, to Chicago, someplace where it was cleaned and refurbished and brought back, and uh, that um, that empty pedestal for the more than a year that it took was rather sad. Um, I'm very glad. I was very glad when she came back. Oh, so it was just the bottom piece just sitting there? Just just that kind of gray right. granite or whatever it is was sitting there. Yeah. Only her or also the people behind? Uh, the, I think the entire la thing. Labor and learning also went up with her. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the whole thing was taken away. Oh, I didn't know that. So like the, the two gentlemen, I suppose. Are labor, labor and labor learning. Lear yes. <laughs> I think labor is the one in the, there's like, a, he, he looks like he's a blacksmith. He has like a, an apron. I think that he's probably labor. I can't remember how learning is dressed. Hmm. But yeah, labor and learning. I didn't know that. Yeah. It only says alma mater. It mm -hmm. doesn't say. Nope. I think the bracket, I, labor and learning. Labor and learning, I think, are standing behind her. Yeah. Interesting. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. All right. The, okay. the next one. So the spirit of time is known for giving rise to many things that you brought here today. Uh, for, for instance, the, the nuclear war with the Cold, mm -hmm. the Cold War. And the you know, satellites were also a consequence of yeah. the Cold War. So the period of the, of the Cold War, overrated or underrated? I think it is unacknowledged how much, not only, you know, I, I think that unacknowledged, let's, let's go farther back, um, is how much the First World War set up, us up for the remainder of the century. There were decisions made about boundaries and about reparations that set us up for the Second World War, for conflict in the Middle East, for conflict in Asia. And so I don't, I think that the Cold War is part of a continuum that started in 1918. It's a natural outgrowth of what happened at the end of the First World War, during the interwar period, after the Second World War, in combination with changes in technology. And I, it has shaped a lot of policy, and it has shaped our view of others. Um, and I don't think that I don't think that the Cold War Cold War is has been acknowledged that way, but also um, we tend to look further back in time with more ease and comfort when we're studying history. It's very difficult to study the history of yesterday or last year. Hmm. It's easier to study the history of something longer ago. And so I, I don't know what kind of scholarship is being done about the Cold War, but I don't know, I also don't know if that scholarship is able to be as impartial or fact-driven as perhaps scholarship about long ago periods. Because in a, in a way, Cold War, it's still here with us. It, 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 didn't, it didn't end with, with Reagan telling Gorbachev to tear down the wall. The speech, yes. It <laughs> did not end with Russia dissolve, with the Soviet Union dissolving. Um, and it didn't end because there are individuals in positions of power and not in positions of power who grew up and they were acculturated into politics or into a worldview during the Cold War era. And it, it still is very deep-seated. So I think Cold War anything is probably underrated. Um, I was able to pick, I don't remember what the prices on these things are, and if, if I did, I wouldn't tell you, but you know the, the, the map with the uh, fallout? Um, People aren't really picking those up yet. Uh, I, in comparison to some other things that I brought, it was reasonably priced. 
but I think in part it's because people aren't looking at that yet. Um, I have bought maps about communism in the United States. I think this is important. We need to be picking this up now because when people are ready to examine it, if we don't have it, they won't be able to do that work. Thank you for, for, for sharing that. Such, a, <laughs> such an interesting perspective. I, I have not heard of that perspective before. Uh -huh. So, okay. thank you. The next one I want to ask, and we have the map right here. Uh, this one? Yes. Uh, okay. So, Alaska is missing. Oh, yeah. The, the it wasn't... Um, it, it, it wasn't a state yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there. So the, <laughs> the Louisiana and Alaska uh, purchase, mm -hmm. overrated or underrated? Well, how could we have fulfilled Manifest Destiny without the purchase of Louisiana? <laughs> yes? Um, uh, well, look at California. You know, it's, it's you know, if, if it was a nation, it would, its gross national product would outstrip that the GNP of many other. It's the fifth GDP in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Texas, the same way. Um, you could also be asking me about should Texas have stayed an independent republic or not? Um, uh, or you could be asking me should these counties down here in Illinois be allowed to form their own state? It was actually on some ballots in some counties in the state of Illinois a couple weeks ago. Um, and it did pass in some places that they are charging whoever in the county government to put together a committee to investigate the possibility. Um, Alaska's kind of weird. Seward's folly, yes. Um, but oh my, talk about natural resources. Um, you know, you know and, and unfortunately they're all extractive. Um, it's, Alaska's just kind of funny. Um, <laughs> It's probably good that um, what would become the Soviet Union didn't have a foothold in North America. Oh, no. Um, we could go and write some speculative fiction about that. But I'd, uh, the Louisiana Purchase, I think, is incredibly important um, to the psyche of the American. Uh, without the Louisiana Purchase, we would not have things like the road trip. We wouldn't have that love affair with the automobile because we'd be right in here and we'd be like another Europe. Back then. You know, here you, you, have, you have the opportunity to be your own person. You, there's, there's something about the wide open spaces of Louisiana Purchase that is really important. Now, should make sure that it's understood. Washington, Oregon, Idaho, California, Nevada, Arizona, not part of Louisiana Purchase. Um, but you know, this idea of sea to sea, uh, it, was, it was something that was being discussed very early in United States history. And you need to remember that part of the revolution, part of the beef against the British government is people weren't allowed to cross the Appalachians and settle. They were stuck on this side. Great Britain didn't want the settlers over here. And so, you know, that, that urge to move out from the Atlantic coast has been going on for European settlers since the start. It's always been going farther up. I don't know what to tell you about Alaska, and Hawaii is also a strange case. <laughs> no, but uh, the, 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 the thing that I found very interesting is how I think Jefferson bought it for, what, 10 million or something for, from France? Which is, I mean, completely... Uh... Uh, and, and you know, it's, well, what was happening is that a Napoleon needed money. Right, right. So it was, it was good timing. Um, the, the crazy thing is that France had kind of turned it over to Spain 
And then through some secret treaty, Spain had kind of uh, given it back to France. There were some weird things that were going on as far as who really owned this area um, at the time. Right. Um, uh, and all other weird things going on here with Florida and over here, this area used to all be called West Florida. You know, this is all Spanish. Um, and so you know, there, there were some other really odd things going on that I've, I've tried to look at maps and, and read and it's like the maps and what I'm reading don't always seem to mesh. Um, and I don't know if that's because the people who were making the maps didn't understand what was going on or if the people were, who were making the maps were so geographically removed because a lot of them were in London that their maps weren't up to date. I, I haven't been able to figure it out, but this, this is just all very confusing here. So um, I think the Louisiana Purchase is incredibly important to the um, United States. It's history, it's economic development, it's ability to attract others. Um, because let me tell you, there wouldn't be a lot of Scandinavians in the United States, except for in Delaware, which was originally a Swedish colony, um, if it hadn't been for Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, North and South Dakota, you know, Nebraska, a um, big Scandinavian. Um, you know, uh, there would have been no place for them to go. History, economics, and everything, and of course, mm -hmm. geography. And geography, <laughs> yep, yep. And, and I think that would be a, a good place to you know, to conclude the conversation. Okay, great. But uh, again, thank you so much. For oh, my pleasure. Such a one of the most uh, special conversations we've oh. ever had, <laughs> and probably will ever have. Uh, have you a, considered writing a book? Um, I do have a book out already. It was really boring. It was called Geographic Information: How to Find It, How to Use It. Um, but it got me tenure, uh, and it was basically a brain dump. Um, you know, about map interpretation, map reading, you know, stuff like that. Um, doing something that's more expressively um, proseful. Uh, no, I haven't thought about it. I, I need to get the stuff that I've already stood up in conferences written first. Mm. Um, I've got uh, one thing that's uh, co-authored that um, we're we're trying to get finished up. We we submitted it, and we're we're trying to get the last bit of revisions done, so it will finally be printed. And I'll cross that one off my list. Um, I have uh, three biggish pieces. Um, one is uh, kind of related to that little guy, where I'm looking at. World atlases published in Great Britain during the imperial century. And I'm actually imperial century writ large, so I'm, I'm actually extending it. The imperial century actually is kind of from 1814 to 1914. So fall of Napoleon till the start of the First World War. That's kind of officially considered the imperial century. But for my purposes, I'm looking also at atlases that were published in the mid to late 1790s through 1920 or 25, you know, just to, um, so I've got that one, the 90 finish up. And then I have another thing about a, a really crazy group called the National Highways Association, basically bankrolled by one person who is very wealthy. And um, this would be a pre First World War. And he had a particular vision about how public roads should be organized and funded and maintained in the United States. He had one version, and then what became the AAA had a different vision. And it actually became more what the federal and state governments do, the way they work with each other is actually more kind of along the lines of what the AAA was seeing. But I've, so I've got that partly written. And then... Um, there was a cartographer named Arthur H. Robinson. Uh, and Robinson um, authored a textbook titled Elements of Cartography. Uh, when he wrote his textbook, there was only one other textbook out. Um, 
end, uh, Robinson had gotten his big start as a cartographer working for the, op the Office of Strategic Services, which was the predecessor of the Central Intelligence Agency during the Second World War. Well, Robinson's textbook went to six editions, which is kind of a bestseller in the cartography world. And so um, I have bits and pieces of that written. Um, but I realized as I was working on it during the second sabbatical that it was suddenly a lot longer than an article, but I couldn't see it being long enough for a book. So I don't know what I'm going to do with the thing. Um, that's the passion. That's the uh, retirement passion project. Um, but you know, I, I did things like I have this, I took some map folders there. When you unfold them, they're um, 36, they're, they're 48 by 36 times two. So they're huge. I have a couple map folders unfolded. And then I have a column for each edition of the textbook and a list in each column by chapter of what the contents of the chapters are. And then colored ribbon or a string or whatever I could find to go from, okay, uh, this concept is in chapter one, it's moved to chapter six, it's moved to an appendice, it no longer appears. So I've got all of the way that the books were organized, how that, how that dance changed. I've got that figured out. Um, and oh my goodness, talk about trying to write this thing. I can do the research, um, but I haven't quite figured out how to do the writing part of it. It's, it is, some of it is so complex. So instead I had a good time creating graphics to go along with it. and. On top of that, to support this one, um, I have, I probably need to go and make sure I can stick that into it. Um, my husband helped me put together, uh, this, this is when Tom still worked for the University Library, a database and a web-based interface that I could use to enter data into the database. And I went through, I'm not certain now, how many cartography textbooks and I have recorded in my database every single thing that is cited in every single one of those textbooks. And I have a database with more than 10,000 entries in it. This is like Librarian's Busman's Holiday. But, you know, it's, you know, I, I, so I can go through and I can say, okay, um, Robinson's first edition, it cites these. Robinson's sixth edition, it cites these. And then I can, I've got a way of, of connecting them. And I can, I can show um, uh, quantitatively how much the citation pattern changed. Um, and I know this sounds really boring, right? But I'm like, hey, it's Robinson. Um, and he's a bit of a mystery. He was at the University of Wisconsin Medicine but he did not keep his papers. He, he like disposed of his papers. They have virtually nothing in the university archives related to Robinson. He had it all at his home and I think he instructed his children to destroy his papers or to put them in the garbage or he did it himself because there's nothing out there. So I can't even, I don't have anything to look at to figure out what his process of writing or determining how things were going to end up. And then the funny thing is the first couple editions, he's the sole author and then more authors get added and you can kind of see when somebody has been added because suddenly there will be a new chapter with that person's knowledge is just stamped all over it. And so you're kind of looking at who was added? I think by the end there were like six or seven different authors, and you know how this was going on, and then comparing his contents to the contents of the competitor. Oh, it's eh, it's entertaining. 
it is. It is. I, I, I hope you, you get some time to, to work on that. Well, I need to, the, the thing I'm going to get, I, the thing I really need to get done is, is the um, World Atlases Project. I have a book truck full of 19th century atlases sitting in the map library reading room and hundreds of photos of um, either those atlases or atlases that are in the rare book and manuscript library. And I, that's the one I need to get done first because for the highways one and for the Robinson textbook one, I've already returned all of my source materials. I figured I needed to kind of narrow my focus, so I returned everything else after making photocopies of title pages. And then I just kept the sources for the World Atlas Project. So I need to get that one done, return everything, and then start with a clean slate on something else. We'll see. We'll see. I, I told Eric, my assistant, I need to spend at least one day writing during break. And then we both laughed. <laughs> so, again, thank you. Um, this is a lot of fun. I warned my husband I'd be home late. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, and my, my, my phone battery died as I was walking into the uh, building. So, um, uh, he just knew that I was going to be late. So, I, I'll appear at home and he'll be surprised that I'm finally at home. I'm going to go home and do laundry. Uh, you know, <laughs> after you have all those clean clothes to go on a trip. Um, but if you want to come back and see Middle Earth in all of its glory, um, back. you know, uh, send me an email and let me know what you're interested in looking at, and or um, and I can I can either have it pulled in advance or I'll have a good idea of where it is. Um, and we can find things really quickly so you have as much time as possible to look at the things you want to look at. It sounds amazing. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Um, I hope you, this probably, yeah, this was our longest episode, I would say. And um, <laughs> worth totally it. Totally embarrassed. Like, <laughs> I, like, this, no, no, it's something we're proud about. Like, we... Some conversation, like some conversation, need to be long to like yeah. fully experience and like understand. And like, like this is something we cannot do in, mm -hmm. in ten minutes. You know, yeah. right? Yeah, supposed to, you know, like what people tell you is like you should do things that are short uh -huh. that people can watch only like two two minutes, like mm -hmm. five minutes. But the, the, the nuance, the context, this is uh -huh. something that you can just sit down and just have a, a right. conversation. Right. So you know, um, we can we could find a way of doing some short things. <laughs> I would prefer not. You would prefer <laughs> not. Okay, that's fine. It, it, that's it, fine. It's always better to you sit down and just <laughs> have a conversation. Like Great. we would never have been able to get like study this map mm -hmm. like in so much detail in yeah. like two minutes maybe. Two minutes? No. Yeah, for me, short is thirty. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Great. So, thank you for for sharing all the knowledge and um, just opening this world of maps to us. Oh, you're um, welcome. You're welcome. This is. Maps are something that I've like glimpsed at, but I've not really mm -hmm. like given a second thought to. Mm -hmm. And like understanding the like reasoning and like the process and the efforts that are put into making these and the efforts that are put into collecting these and making sure that the next generation can use them to learn so many things yeah. about the history and like all the mistakes that people have made or all the wonderful things that you can find out by just mm -hmm. sitting down and looking at them. It's just. Um, yeah blows my mind and um, it's something that I'm sure I'm going to keep coming back to right. and it's it, it was wonderful having you here and uh, you're an inspiration well, well, thank you thank and you. I hope people on campus can um, go to the main mm -hmm. library and check these out for themselves right. and just get a chance to talk with you mm -hmm. I think that'll that'll change the perspectives too okay so. great Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. And maybe some of them will, will switch out from pre-med to geography. <laughs> yes. Yes. I do my best uh, to <laughs> recruit for the geography department. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, stay curious. This is the URC Talk Show, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.